For me, the ultimate form of addiction, though, is the idea of ourselves. That's where we're all trapped. Mm. So it's such a blind spot that you don't know that it's you. It's just who you are that you are. They could say, I, I don't feel safe right now. That's a very different environment than I am not safe as a continuum. There's always the possibility of stepping back. That is the truth of who we are. Correct. That and is that the is life. freedom. So that is that the connection is. between truth and freedom. Yes. So when you're free, you're not fighting the world, which you're is really you're not fighting yourself. You're at ease. When yeah. you're at ease, body tends to function pretty well. And now this is the slippery part is the ego wants its predominant imperative is to be right about its own idea of itself. Mm. So now we will start to seek evidence to confirm our reality even though it might be to our own detriment. Confirmation bias. Yes. Yeah. I would also say money is something else that lets us coordinate our actions in this way. And money is a conversation ultimately, right? If right. you really understand it. Tell me more about that. <laughs> There's no such thing as success. It's, it's just- Cultural it, programming. That starts to dabble now with power and what I would assert is true success because I've worked with multiple billionaires that I wouldn't say are successful, but they have a lot of money. Right. Because to me, success is synonymous with peace. I'm not giving somebody something. I'm helping them reveal what's already been there, always been there. I'm helping you see that by seeing what's in the way. Mm. So it's a revelatory process. This is the dimension of being human. For me, the most powerful part of this was 15 minutes after I had the realization, one, I don't know, the nature of life is uncertain. And most profoundly, for the first time in my life, I was okay with that. I stopped the suffocation, yeah. which is really of myself. Wow. Right? Again, one of my favorite quotes, I say, the ego is nothing but a bow constrictor for the soul. <laughs>
it's all pretense anyway, but it, it's a good placeholder for now in this lifetime. <laughs> yes, well, we, we do need architecture, and I think yeah. the mind would be the first place to start, uh, yeah. uh, reasonably enough, before we architect anything else. So, yeah, um, yeah, we were having a good riff offline about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, and man, I guess the, subject. <laughs> the natural place, maybe not the natural place, a place to start mm. is this quote that I always go back to of yours, which you shared previously yeah. on the show, which is your definition of addiction. Yes. And addiction, traditionally people think of that as a physiological substance yeah. dependence. Mm-hmm. But there's also this dimension of you know money printing that we go into. There's also this dimension of, I guess, even relational dependence, right? People get into Absolutely. certain types of relationships that might not, that may be abusive, but they're still addicted to kind of things. Yeah, happens. Uh, Stockholm syndrome com- comes up as, an, as a, a, maybe an extreme version of that. Yeah. So could we start with just you giving us that wonderful definition of addiction again. Sure. So with regards to addiction, they say that you can't get enough of something that almost works. Mm. And that's that sort of, in relationships, called uh, intermittent reinforcement. Mm. So they did experiments where they recognized that if they had rats in a cage and they were able to press a pedal that um, a pellet would come out of food. And so, of course, just even at that level of IQ, they recognized, okay, well, if I want food, I'm just going to press this. Mm -hmm. And then they were... thinking, well, hang on a minute, if we stop, uh, then of course at some point that being gives up, right? Which we also see in life. If you're not getting that reward, Mm -hmm. then at some point the behavior is going to adapt. But they recognize that if they did it intermittently, randomly, Mm. it actually created an addiction Mm. because you weren't sure when it was going to come, but there was this aspirational hope that it would Mm. still come at some point. So this is what we see with people sitting at a slot machine. They may well be three, five, seven hundred bucks in the hole, but if they get that eight dollars and fifty cents they won, huh. it's sufficient intermittent reinforcement that it will keep them going. To so the mm-hmm. same in relationships, the same with pretty much any behavior. Like as long as somebody, you know, and this happens a lot with women who are in what we could call abusive relationships, as long as the guy in their mind is, yeah, but he's not so bad, he does X, and they can have a, a an example or a case study for the reason that he's actually a good guy then they'll they'll sit around and they'll stay waiting for that next pellet mm-hmm. of goodness to come along. So um, that's one form of addiction. Uh, for me, the ultimate form of addiction, though, is the idea of ourselves. That's where we're mm. trapped. Tell me, what, when you say the idea of ourselves, that's yeah. different from the ontological notion. Uh, notion? The ontological reality of ourselves, there's yeah, a difference so, between the idea and what's real. Yeah, so we we exist, our, like, I mean, we're sitting here, we have these two meat suits, as I call them, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. we could sit in a car and you could be a, a Ford, whatever, truck, and mm-hmm. I could be a Range Rover or a Toyota. It doesn't really matter, right? But we know that we're not the vehicle in which we travel. Mm-hmm. So without getting too esoteric out of the gates, if we look at who we are as these, you know, it sounds poetic, but timeless, boundless beings who are really mm-hmm. vibrational souls or spirits, mm-hmm. then... We're not this meat suit. And the evidence we see or don't see necessarily, but we know of every day, which is people die. Yeah. So if hopefully this doesn't happen. It'd be very inconvenient to the podcast. But if I, <laughs> if I were to die right in front of you, then everything that you see and might even relate to as me is still here. Right. Even the brain that carries all of this data, yeah. which is the experiences of my life and my memory, if someone were to know what they're doing, they could cut that open if they knew how to extract the files. You know, it's right. like, oh, there's Peter's childhood. Yeah. But then where the hell did I go, right? right? You didn't even see me leave, right? So this is sort of that interesting phenomenon of like who we are as sort of this this eph- ephemeral, but like you can't kind of even describe it. Yeah. So that's why the idea of ourselves in the in the context that I'm using it is more the conversation that we are, f- that we are which mm-hmm. is, I know, a weird sentence, but... The you that you are for yourself. It's not even a belief because people talk about limiting beliefs. Mm. I would assert limiting beliefs even belong to the you that you are for yourself. Mm. So it's such a blind spot that you don't know that it's you. It's just who you are that you Mm. are. So that's the ultimate addiction because that's what drives our thoughts, conscious thoughts, our feelings, consequently our behaviors, the thoughts and feelings tending to be the precursor to all actions. And then our actions are certainly the precursors to our outcomes. Right. So when people are trying to control outcomes, which is really the MO of every human being, where they yeah. want to make money, find love, lose weight, yeah. start a business, it's all in the realm of performance and action. Sure. 
So this is why I sort of reverse engineer, where if you understand what is the cause of all thoughts, feelings, consequently actions, then you have some sort of domain over out, uh, outcomes and results. Interesting. So, 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 that, so that's the addiction. Is this subconscious narrative and conversation that we're oblivious to, but is close enough to the surface that if you're willing to perhaps do enough mining that you can start to, if only through the travesties and the frustrations of life, see how that you relate to things, which is how... You know, my quote, I say, life will present you with people and circumstance to reveal where you're not free. Mm. So life is really the conduit through which we get to see the constraints of our subconscious so that we can see they're not valid, investigate the validity of these narratives that are based in some sort of constraint, and then discover freedom on the other side of those. That's really the premise of my work. Wow. Fascinating <laughs> stuff. And it gets straight to the... I mean, we talk obviously on the show a lot about economics, which led me to Mises and the study of human action and, yeah. and actions really being louder than words, as the old adage goes. Mm -hmm. um, is this, are we able to identify what you're describing here as the idea of the self? Is that identified with the internal chatter or the, the, the dialogue you have with yourself? And is it a matter of understanding that that you are not the conversation you're having with yourself about yourself all the time is that what you're doing here? for sure so to answer the first part it's inextricably connected yeah. right so the genesis of conscious thought we're aware of when we're sitting in a car by ourselves when we're going to bed at night before we fall asleep when we're in the shower sitting on the toilet whatever we're doing usually in the absence of other distractions or humans we're not in external conversation the internal dialogue starts to become relatively more noticeable mm. And you're thinking, you're like, you know, oh, I'm thinking about what I want to do tomorrow, mm. next week, who I'm meeting. So that conversation, if you just understand the very simple practicalities of being aware of a conversation, implicit within that is you can't be the conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? There's got to be you're, some... You're observing it. Or there has to be it. some essence of awareness that the conversation is occurring. It's like when people say, I'm depressed. It's not a truth, right? Because if you're aware of the experience of depression, then you can't be depressed. Because if you were depressed, you wouldn't feel depression. Right. So right there, there's a opening for people who struggle with that, which we will have it, you know, yeah. varying degrees. Sometimes it's chronic, sometimes it's intermittent. Could be a day or two after grieving or mm -hmm. loss of something. It's very natural. Mm. But when people declare these statements like, that's who I am, mm. that's another form of that addiction. You mm -hmm. now, through the process of language, become associated with something you're not, and now this is the slippery part is the ego wants its predominant imperative is to be right about its own idea of itself. Mm. So now we will start to seek evidence to confirm our reality, even though it might be to our own detriment. Confirmation bias. Yes. Yeah. And this is how people see things too, right? And so it's a very, it's a powerful phenomenon that you don't necessarily see the, see the world the way it is, but you see the way that you see it. So everyone is really a walking perspective, right. which is valuable when you understand that, because I would assert, again, without getting too esoteric, that the nature of consciousness is unity. Right. But we could say it in poetic terms of, oh, we're all one. And, you know, yeah. you go to a yoga class, they may even have that on the wall, right? right. Like it's yeah. a sort of mantra that's appealing yeah. to the harmony of what it is to be human. Right. But if you understand the nature of oneness, it doesn't have any relativity. Therefore, there's no experience. So through diversification, which is the you over there and the me here and everyone who's listening, yeah. we have these unique vantage points which actually gives rise to relativity with relativity we have experience or relationship right which is why relationships tend to be the greatest catalyst for growth right so the beauty of unity is that it's powerful it's love it's you know whatever you want to appeal to inside no, of something yeah, it's like yeah. deeper disposition for goodness but we need diversity in order to actually discover unity which is sort right. of rub so one of my quotes i say yes we're all one but would we know that without the we right Wow, there's so much here. The the term <laughs> synoptic integration comes to mind. Okay. You said each of us is a walking perspective. Yes. But we also need to assimilate our perspectives so that we can coordinate our actions towards common aims, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of the magic of being human is that we can collaborate at such a large, flexible, in such large scales in such flexible ways, right? This yes. is why we outcompete other animals and are at the top of the food chain, et cetera. It seems like we do. <laughs> yeah. And so it seems like l language is a key tool to integrating these multiple perspectives. Yeah. Uh, also, I would also say money is something else that lets yes. us coordinate our actions in this way. And uh, money is a conversation ultimately, right? If you right. really understand it. Tell me more about that. <laughs> well, so it's an agreed upon phenomenon. Yeah. 
Like it doesn't actually exist in of itself. It's like success, right? I just in one of my mastermind modules was talking about what is true success. We have success as a conversation that we have collectively agreed upon. So therefore, it starts to have this feeling of reality, even though it's just a conversation. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to go to a tribe in the Amazon, they would have a completely different interpretation of success. Right. So it's right. not. It don't, there's no such thing as success. It's, it's just cultural programming of some kind. It's all programming. It's yeah. all conversation. This is why I'm such a advocate of understanding the power of words, especially as associated with your own idea of yourself. Yeah. Because who you are is ultimately just a walking conversation, which is break it down. Uh -huh. What is that? It's programming, predominantly yeah. created through the triggers of your childhood. Usually those that are traumatic become those that define you the most because yeah. it's an avoidant energy, right? We get hurt. It's only natural through the brain, which is to predict and protect, that we want to avoid being hurt again. Right. So we tend to be skewed towards the trials and tribulations and the failures, which it seems like common sense if you're in the world of survival, but it's a complete like um, misnomer in terms of becoming actually a vibrant, healthy, free being. Right, because it's it's look at the healthcare system, right? Talk about the the pretense of language. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing to do with health in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. How do we know this? Because the specialists who are part of it, doctors and nurses, God bless them, good people, mm -hmm. well intended, mm -hmm. they want to make a difference, but they're in a system that's got nothing to do with health. How do we know this? Well, a doctor goes to school, they learn the basics, anatomy, which is structure, the mm -hmm. meat suit, that's mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. They learn physiology. How does the meat suit work? That's helpful, mm -hmm. biology. Then they learn pathology. What happens when the meat suit or the biology of the meat suit doesn't work? That's called disease, mm -hmm. sickness. Mm -hmm. Then they learn intervention, which is pharmacology, because mm -hmm. that's the people paying the bills. And then they do maybe some sort of specialization and become surgeons, or whatever. Nowhere in there is there anyone learning anything about health. Mm -hmm. That would be akin to me mm -hmm. taking one of my athletes, say an MLB guy, and I say, I got this great guy who's going to help you with the hitting. There's an awesome. What does he specialize in? I'm like, he specializes in striking out. <laughs> Like, how the fuck is that going to uh, help me? Uh. So again, it's no sly on doctors. They save lives and there's obviously a place for it. But you start to see the propaganda and we could argue at some level intentionally so yeah. that we are giving all of this power and this um, and this this sort of almost gospel-like praise towards somebody in a white lab coat as though they are going to take care of our health and, and our vitality. Right? No, they might save your life. But this is also why if we look at health, like money, like anything on a gradient, you know, I talk about minus 10 through zero to plus 10. Most human beings, by virtue of the fact they're being defined by what they don't want, they're living in the zero to minus 10. You know, if you're at minus one, minus two, you have acid reflux, maybe the occasional yeah. headaches and a little bit of IBS, maybe that's minus four, yeah. cancers are minus eight, minus nine. And so it's a fix-it mentality. Yeah. So people are making most of their choices based on a reaction to what they don't want which again is one of my quotes. They say, you're never going to create the life you want by trying to fix the life you don't want. I'm but that's, that's what drives most people's choices. So it's actually not a choice. It's a figurative choice. In their case, it's actually literal, but it's being defined by something they don't want, which is why most people don't have the lives they want. They're in reaction to the life they don't want. They don't want to be overweight, so they join the gym in January. But that's very short-lived because they're being driven by a fear-based principle mm. not a creative energy which is passion and inspiration aspiration like i'm going to the gym and i'm paying my 50 100 bucks a month because i don't want to be out of shape right but you're being informed by that which you don't want so this <laughs> okay i'm trying to find the through line here but this you said money as a conversation so going Let's back see. to money is an agreed upon thing right yeah. and we're giving it value there's you know, you've obviously known many people and you speak so eloquently to the fictitiousness of the current fiat system, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's all lies, right? It's smoke <laughs> and mirrors. Yeah. And you could speak about that for hours as you do, thankfully, and yes. educate people. Mm -hmm. So you're well more versed, you're way more versed in that than I am. But it, as in terms of the value proposition of what money is, it's based on a conversation that we're in agreement that if I give you this piece of paper that has the number 10 on it, mm -hmm. that that has in the marketplace a certain amount of value. Mm -hmm. But it's not actually inherent it's agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? Because yeah. you take that $10 and you go to like Iceland or something, like right. unless you're in a bureau de change, they're like, that doesn't mean anything to them. Sure. Right. Right? Socially so constructed. It's, it's all socially yeah. constructed. Yeah. These are all just agreed upon phenomena yeah. that we as human beings have complied with. Yeah. And then we fall into that as though it's a truth. Yes. But it's not a truth. It's just agreed upon conversation. Right. Now, the conversation is constantly in flux to a certain degree. And obviously, we seem to be in a a particular realm or era right now where the, the whole digital world is starting to become more commonplace. Obviously, we've got the whole crypto world that's been around for a while, whether we get these central bank digital currencies. Like, yeah. 
these what are they they're, they're conversations it's literally like hollywood huh. like you watch a good movie and you think the person that you're in that love with or enamored <laughs> with or you hate because they're the bad guy really works at this company called whatever inc right. no it's made up somebody wrote that on a piece of paper because they're a screenplay writer and then the producers brought people together and the director shot it. And now you're bought into this as though it's like, well, get the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And then you even mm -hmm. have emotional responses. It's shifting your physiology. Okay. It's all fictitious. It's a great illusion. Okay. It's just when we come out of the theater and we step into our own life, we think the illusion we're in is actually a truth, but it's still an illusion. Interesting. So we haven't gone deep enough, perhaps. I want to ask you about, because we talk a lot on this show about the corruption of money. Yes. Yeah. If money is a conversation... We're having a corruption of this conversation or the socially constructed tool that yeah. we use to coordinate our actions. Control, power. Control. Yeah. How do you think, I guess, how would you define corruption? And then how would the corruption of the, the conversation that is money lead to the corruption of the conversation that is the self? I think it's the other way around. So okay. I think as I was saying earlier, predominantly because we are wired, certainly wired, certainly in this current iteration of the human being. And what I'm working on my work is, is it's not even an upgrade. It's the, the realization of a new type of human being, a new type of operating mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. So the one that I call currently is this 1.0 mindset, which is based in fundamentally limitation, fear and suffering and disease. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the cascade. Mm -hmm. If by design you're living in these con constraints of your subconscious, which everybody is, it's not bad, it doesn't make you a bad person, mm -hmm. but it's going to drive all of the dysfunction and the things that you struggle with where you mm -hmm. have problems and you're upset then you are going to have the predominant underlying emotion, which is fear, some kind of concern. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to create suffering. And then with mm -hmm. that, it cascades through your physiology and you get sick, right? This mm -hmm. is why most mm -hmm. people get some sort of disease. It might take a while, could take decades if you're built like an ox. Like you're going to probably <laughs> be fine for a while, but there's still dis-ease in your body, yeah. right? And I've, I've, yeah, I've had issues and continue to have issues. Yeah, and for you, they're going to be predominantly inflammatory. Like yes. we talked about the exactly. emotional responses yeah. you tend yeah. to have. So- when you recognize that cascade, what I'm introducing to people is like the world of freedom, love, and possibility that's mm. on the other side of the constraints of subconscious. So in East, Eastern terms, it's Sartori or enlightenment mm. or awakening, you know, address mm. it up however you want. For me, in very practical terms, no, you're just not living in a limitation of your subconscious. Mm. And that gives the cascade of liberation and freedom through your physiology, which makes you then more vital, mm. both in terms of prana flowing or the absence of dis-ease, like mm. dis-ease mm -hmm. is the absence of ease. Right. So when you're free, you're not fighting the world. Which you're at ease. You're not fighting yourself, you're at ease. When yeah. you're at ease, body tends to function pretty well, yeah. aside from any kind of congenital issues. Yeah. Oh. And then that also creates harmony in your relationships, and, and so it sort of ripple effects out, right. right? So in terms of the conversation, the corruption, to answer your question, what is corruption? If I were to use one word, I'd say it's a lie. It's a lie. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so there's a lapse, there's an absence in integrity, which comes back to words, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I told you, which I did today, that I'd come here and meet you at four, yeah. Now if I showed up at five, <laughs> right, right. I mean, I'm not a criminal. That's a <laughs> misrepresentation, representation, though. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it's really where our language and our words, uh, our words and our actions don't align. Uh, Very subtle, but you could say that is a form of corruption. Interesting. Because we're misusing the ultimate power, which is in the beginning was the word. Yeah. Again, I'm not particularly religious, but you can pull tenants and yeah. see the power of actually language. Right. So what I love about words and why I say I traffic in language is because if you know magic, everybody who's watched a magician, whether it be on TV or mm -hmm. live, they will say, albeit maybe old school now, abracadabra. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think David Blaine says that. <laughs> <laughs> the more contemporary magician. It's definitely a becomes, magic term. No, they're very sophisticated. But- the actual Hebrew translation of abracadabra, which is beautiful, and when I heard that, it just like sent shivers through my spine, was, as I speak, so I create. Mm. Wow. So who we are, ultimately, in terms of the ability to use language, is we're magicians. Mm. The world is made of pixie dust. Mm. So you start to recognize that our words create our reality. Now, to the degree that we're not corrupt, to mm -hmm. the degree that we're not out of integrity. Of right. If somebody says, I'm going I'm to lose... First of all, let's take a very simple example. Someone says, I'm going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Millions of people right now. I mean, it's one of the billion dollar industries that has really been a complete shit show for decades because mm -hmm. it's obviously not working. Right? Mm -hmm. If you just look at the stats of increased amount of obesity and mm -hmm. diabetes and stuff like that. But even saying I'm going to lose weight is a very powerless statement. Mm -hmm. 
Because first of all, you don't lose weight. It's not like, oh shit, I was at the mall and I lost my ass. I can't find it. Does anyone, you know, I'm looking for a very right. heavy tricep. You know? right. <laughs> so even the language itself becomes powerless. It doesn't declare how much. Like, so right. if I were to confront someone and they said that, I'd say, how much? They'd be like, what? Yeah. That, that how much? Well, I don't know. Oh, okay. But like, if you're a ship in a harbor, you say, I'm going to sell to, you don't know where, yeah. like that boat is adrift. Right. So like, oh, well, I don't know, like 15 pounds. Okay, great. By when? What? I mean, I don't know. Like, okay, would you want to get, do you actually want to actually yeah. create a result here? So you start to see how powerless people are with their words. Right. So corruption to me is where we don't recognize the power of who we are. The magic of language, as I said earlier, one of my quotes is wardrobe, uh, words of the wardrobe for the soul. Yes. And so I would assert the soul being timeless and boundless and limitless, which is really the realm of potentiality itself. Right. You can't realize your potential. You can continue to access it. Yeah. You know, that's a, you know, if a, if a coach or a spiritual teacher is like, I'm going to help you realize your potential, I'd say run, right? Because potential to me is a mountain without a top. It's a never ending prophecy. Yeah. If you realize the potential, then you've actualized it, then it's no longer potential. No, what's, what's next? Yeah. Right? This is right. where you see athletes who actually accomplish their quote unquote childhood dreams and then they go into depression. Yeah. Because they weren't dreaming big enough. Right. They actually right. got to the end point of their conversation. Yes. Not what's possible right and when you really understand what we think is possible even people with great imaginations is not what's possible yes it's a it's a real mind fuck right, right. like what you think is possible as a very smart guy well traveled <laughs> well read is not what's possible right it's a speck yes as to what's possible so then when you start to entertain that this whole realm of realizing potential is an ongoing prophecy, which is a good thing. I mean, it can be exhausting at one level because like, damn it, I just got to Sure, go. sure, sure. Right. So to come full circle, because I know I'm downloading a lot, but in terms of like corruption as it relates to money, it's really where in lay terms we're being lied to. Yes. Wow, that's excellent. Um, yeah. The Schopenhauer quote came up for me that every man takes the limits of his field of vision for the limits of reality. Mm -hmm. All right. That we think that the limits of what we can see or the the conversation i guess that we're having is all that there is but yeah we're all just walking perspectives so yeah. in reality that's not all of reality yeah um i don't know if this is a metaphorical question or this is an actual question but are okay. we talking about the relationship in your work are you talking about the relationship between human cognitive software and how it influences human biological hardware is that mm -hmm. what we're kind of tuning or programming here that's one aspect for sure okay. I, I and i think that's less interesting at least to me than how it drives behavior uh -huh. right so of course we're going to have the mechanisms of power physiology functions if you're in a state of stress because mm -hmm. of the particular perspective you carry as one is a threat response, right? You grew up in an environment where it was very mercurial, somebody was very loud or angry or hostile, then that child learned the world of relativity, which in this case might be that I'm not safe. Mm -hmm. Might be one of these, what I call mm -hmm. these 10 primal prisons of the subconscious. So that now may be an executive who is, you know, charged with once a month doing a presentation and he really struggles with social anxiety or a lot of Mm. you know uh, anxiety relating to presentations which has got nothing to do with his acumen his ability his experience mm -hmm. his powerpoint presentation skills uh -huh. but it's because deep down his way of relating to life is i'm not safe mm. so that again would be one of the corruptions of his particular identity because it's a lie mm. is that a lie though because it although is. are we always not safe in some no, way it's a lie it's so i make the distinction between again one of my quotes i say everything's real it's just nothing's true Okay, you got to expand Which, on that. That's really <laughs> subtle, right? So it's real in terms of like, if we were to measure in this particular case, giving this executive, his vital signs, his blood right. pressure would go up, his respiratory rate would go up, he'd have perspir perspiration on hands and certainly yeah. his underarms. So that, so it's real, it's tangible. We can yeah. actually measure diagnostically what's going on. Maybe the tone of his voice, the speed with which he speaks relative to how he normally would in a very lazy environment with his family at home. Um, so that's real. Yeah. But it's built on the premise that is an experience, which in this case could be 30, 40 decades old. Hence, in today's existence, it's a lie. And it would even be a lie as a kid because you can feel not safe even though there's actually nothing threatening. It's mm -hmm. just the response. Like dad is fighting and arguing with mom or mom's throwing things or dad is making threats, could mm -hmm. be saying something, disciplining a child. 
in a particularly hostile way. Mm -hmm. So the way that that physiology then reacts to that, especially as a kid, because we're dependent, like right. we we are primarily reliant upon care providers. Because if we get kicked out of the tribe, we're going to be eaten by bigger pro right. predators, mm -hmm. right? So that's yeah. deep in the DNA. Yeah. So it's appropriate for a kid, but even the linguistic programming based in these subconscious narratives of I'm not safe isn't necessarily a truth. Like I was saying, I'm, so when someone says I'm depressed, it's not a truth. You could mm -hmm. feel depressed. If the kid had the wherewithal with the evolution of an adult, mm -hmm. which of course they don't, they could say, I, I don't feel safe right now. Mm. That's a very different environment than mm -hmm. I am not safe mm -hmm. as a continuum. Right. So that's where this corruption again happens. And it's, uh, this is all new to me in terms of making that association between corruption and a lie. So I'm actually mm -hmm. excited that that came up today because mm -hmm. I'm going to explore that more. Because if you think about it in terms of a building, if there was an earthquake somewhere on the West Coast, the building that's lost its integrity is, say, one of the corner pillars because of whatever, erosion over time, poor materials, perhaps the structure wasn't created so well in that corner. Mm -hmm. We could, maybe a stretch of the imagination, obviously describe that's where it's lost its integrity, meaning the right. integrity of where it's Structural functioning well. Integrity. Structural integrity. Yeah. Which I would say is synonymous with there's some corruption there. Right. Something has, is untoward. Something has, is no longer working in the way that it's intended. Right. So that's where things fall apart because it's a lie to the way it is the intention. Right. Okay. Right. So in terms the of building is being, intended to stand, <laughs> but it's sort of misrepresenting. It's not adequate to its intention. Exactly. Yeah. Not to the plans, not to whatever yeah. the architect had initially, you know, created with the, the contractor. No. So again, you start to look at, okay, from the position of the human spirit, which I'm going to say naturally is well intended. Uh -huh. You know, there's the story of the monk who's walking down the by, by the river and the, with a young monk, and he sees a scorpion on the edge, but it's in the water. Mm. And the old man reaches down to take the scorpion out of the water. And as he does, to start to set it down, the scorpion stings him. Mm. And as he stings him, it drops out of his head into the water. Mm. And he does this again, and how thing happens again, and he does it a third time. Huh. And the young the young monk says, why do you keep lifting the scorpion out of the water when you're realizing it's stinging you? He said, it is the nature of a scorpion to sting, but just as it is the nature of a scorpion to sting, so it is the nature of a human to be kind and compassionate. Mm. So there's something that between that which we could call inherent and natural versus that which becomes normalized. It's not normal for people to be sick. It's not normal to, for people mm -hmm. to be depressed. It's not normal for people to be anxious. We've normalized it. Mm -hmm. But it's actually, I'm looking at these natural qualities. So mm. I would say it's natural for a human being to be in integrity mm. and within the right conditions growing up to learn the power of language and what we say in terms of what we intend. Mm. But because we're all human, we fall prey to the fact that we don't complete on our declarations. It could be as right. mundane as being late to a meeting yeah. or it could be more significant like, you know, you declare that you're going to clean your act up because you've got cancer, but you don't mm. actually do anything about it. You become resigned and... You know, things propagate right. and you become sick. Um, so either way, it's very fascinating when you look through this lens of corruption or what I call pretense or a fundamental lie, mm -hmm. that who we are for ourselves is this conversation that's based in reality, to mm -hmm. come back to your question, but isn't fundamentally a truth. So ultimately, it's all make-believe. Why are you the way you are? Because that's who you say you are. Mm -hmm. It's not that that's who you are. So that goes back to a walking perspective. What is a perspective? It's a view, which is based on the programming that inherently you quote unquote inherited in the environment that you grew up in. Is this rooted in the limitations of language itself? And that we, the, the, uh, the map is not the territory as the old saying goes, mm -hmm. we can never contain the totality of reality in words alone. So that if we're defining ourselves as a conversation or the conversation that we're yeah. having with ourselves, that that necessarily excludes aspects of our being that are not containable within words sure absolutely why i say words are the wardrobe for the soul yeah. so again if you look and you know both of you and i have pretty decent lexicons and decent decent wardrobes <laughs> decent <laughs> wardrobes for the body um so yes the degree i could you could say the degree to which people have access to the language is the degree to which certain things in life become more available right right so i'll give you a very a simple example when i was um, first studying yoga, I was introduced to an Ayurveda practitioner as part of the course that I did. It just so happened this yoga teacher was very passionate about all aspects of yoga, and Ayurveda is sort of the sister arm. And I'd never heard of Ayurveda. 
And this teacher, she just spent an afternoon with us, practitioner, and just like left me with my my jaw ajar. I was like, oh my god, suddenly finally knows what it is to understand diet and lifestyle has mm-hmm. and how it relates to the energy of our body. Mm-hmm. You know, we'd had the be bright for your blood type, the balanced diet, the South Beach diet, whatever. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of mm-hmm. man made diets. But why this was so appealing to me is I recognize Ayurveda is speaking to the natural qualities of the elements that are part of life. Mm. So whether it's air, fire, water, or earth, they all have these inherent characteristics. Mm. And we are part of nature, so somebody who's more fire is going to have the same characteristics, more inflammatory disorders. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to see things because light, fire, brings the ability to see. So Mm -hmm. they're the perfectionists. Is this the dosha? Doshas, yes. Lots of bits of kapha. I think I'm a fire, actually. (laughs) Yes, you are. With a bit of kapha, which is earth. So why I'm bringing that up as an example is because prior to having the language or the distinction of Ayurveda and all the doshas, that wasn't available to me. Mm. So why was that important? Because, for example, if I had a sore throat, what would I do based on the linguistics that were available to me, whatever I've seen in TV advertisements or people who are friends who have said, go to CVS Mm -hmm. and get X, you know, over-the-counter prescription, whatever it is, that's in the world of what's available to me. Mm -hmm. Once I discovered Ayurveda and understood the actual, for me, energetics and physiology, for example, of a cold or a sore throat, there's an entirely different world that suddenly becomes possible Mm. using diet, lifestyle, and herbs Mm. to be able to, quote-unquote, in this case, be more palliative or curative. Mm. So that's where language can be very limiting. Mm. And we could assert that words themselves are by design limited because you're saying something on top of something that doesn't need to be said, right. if that makes sense. right? So it's it's beautiful. I say words are both the lock and the key is one of the things <laughs> I say, right? So words create the I'm not good enough. That's a lock. Yeah. But it is through hopefully, you know, supportive counseling, friends, therapy, coaching, whatever it is you need, that you can actually use words to unlock the I'm not good enough and recognize that it's a pretense. It's a false statement. Wow. You've got evidence for it. Well, yeah. my brother was the athlete. My sister was the academic. Right. But therefore, you've ascertained from your environment that who you were is I'm not good enough. That's maybe how you felt, but it's not a truth. And that became part of the identity that you became addicted to. And now you've got the, quote, unquote, symptoms of adrenal fatigue because you're a perfectionist and a people pleaser as a coping strategy for fundamentally what was a lie. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are words a lo- both the lock and the key in the sense that, well, they're locking you out of this experience of primary human reality, right? Like we can't compress our visceral experience into words alone, right? Words are kind of... That's one component. But the key aspect is because we're able to connect with other people and relate to them in a way we otherwise couldn't without words. The key I'm looking at more in terms of being able to undo the lock, right? So it's language confines us by virtue of I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, Mm. I'm not loved. And I usually put in the term of negation. Mm -hmm. So again, that to me is the ultimate corruption, Mm -hmm. right? So using a play on continuing the theme here, if who we are, and again, it's just my assertion, is these limitless, timeless, beautiful beings mm-hmm. that are pure potentiality, pure possibility. Mm-hmm. So let's take that as infinite, right? Which is all, it's hard for the mind to even fathom. Mm-hmm. But then just like that bottle of water on the table, we could argue that water itself doesn't have any form other than its structure of itself as an element. Right. But you put it in a bottle, it becomes a bottle of water. Right. You put it in a glass, it becomes a glass of water. You put it in a tub, it's a tub of water. Yeah. So that's the words create are the wardrobe for the soul. The soul is, quote, unquote, undefined. So we use language to define it, to give it shape. So who you are is Robert. And, of course, there's different levels of programming. Your DNA is maybe the deepest. Right. So that's the hardware. But then what I'm working on is software. The personality is based in language. So somebody with your similar hardware, and let's face it, whether you had a twin or you had friends who got, you know, you could be an NFL player who's strong and robust, good good joints if they have different software their capacity to create results is going to be commensurate with whatever that software is Mm. so you can meet somebody like you in terms of your physiology and your hardware who for whatever reasons was bullied and mocked maybe they were smaller at school so now they've grown into a very strong man but because of their software they can't access that because who they are is, well, no, I don't want to get into trouble. I don't want to upset anyone. Mm-hmm. That might be part of their code. Mm-hmm. Conversely, you might have somebody who's 50, 40 pounds lighter than you, 
but they grew up in a very hostile environment with brothers where they literally had to learn to survive and defend themselves mm. and they can kick the shit out of somebody your size mm. not because of the <laughs> quote unquote hardware but because their software gives them access to that wow that's reminds me of the old saying in Tennessee they said it's not the size of the dog in the fight but the size like of the fight and the, the dog. dog exactly so that's the software so to come back to the lock and the key so if somebody's walking around with these negations, as I call them, that's the ultimate form of corruption. Because mm-hmm. to finish my point, if you're a limitless, boundless being, we could say that's godlike. It's divine. It's right. your inherent soul. Is this just in the present? When you say limitless, infinite, like is that just fully absorbed in the present, free of all the distortions of language? There's moments that people would probably have that. For example, if they were doing plant ceremonies, DMTs, like yeah. people have these ecstasy type blissful moments. Yeah which we could say is when you overcome or override the default network or the ego, right? right, right? right so right. in the absence of you, you're left with like this godlike experience, a god yeah. molecule, right? I, I've yeah. never done any of these drugs. I'm, right. I'm a purist in my conditioning. And so, you know, when you have those moments in the dissolution of the idea of yourself, yeah. the ultimate addiction is gone. Yeah. You're left with the presence of pure possibility. Uh, okay. So the lock is, okay, you've got the infinite, but now it becomes bound through language. So if who I am is everything, but the way I associate myself with or the languaging that I become addicted to in my deep narrative is I'm not good enough. Right. And I have the evidence repeatedly ad nauseum in my childhood. I was disciplined. I didn't get four out of, you know, I only got four out of five hits in baseball. I got the B plus, not the A. There's evidence for me believing I'm not good enough. Now that's a lot. It's a constraint because you're limitless. Yeah, but who I am for myself as the identity is, no, I'm not good enough. Then we develop strategies and compromises Mm -hmm. and coping strategies. So that person might become middle management. They don't really run the rock the boat. They don't speak up in their conference meetings, but they are a perfectionist at home or they're a people pleaser in their relationship, all commensurate with the fundamental lock of I'm not good enough. So the key is therapy, maybe plant medicine. Like we could say plant medicine, there's a form of language and code that happens there. But in my work, because it's what I do, is when I'm helping people to see these negations, so I am something, is the root upon which everything is built. But if it's I'm not, then I'm immediately in conflict with my potentiality. Uh So if I'm not good enough, then what I'm saying is, deep down, I am enough, more than enough, I'm everything, but the way I'm going to portray myself in society and how I'm going to show up is I'm not good enough. And then there could be coping on top Mm -hmm. of that. I, didn't we talk about it? I think in our first podcast, the guy who's got the corner office, who's driving the Mercedes and has a beautiful house in the suburbs, energetically is not that different to the guy on the streets who's got a heroin addiction. Because mm. they're both being driven by the negation. It's just mm. one is bought into it. I'm not enough or I'm not loved. Mm. But the guy in the corner office is I'm not enough is a coping strategy. Mm. He's being driven by the same constraint, the log. Right. And so what he's done is to try and disprove it, whereas the other human proved it. They didn't have a support structure. They didn't have the will to try and compensate. So divergent responses to the same catalyst. Yeah. Something like that. What isn't this... So when I think about human action, Mm -hmm. we do have to choose a particular path at the exclusion of all other possible paths, right? And I mean this in the broadest sense, Yeah. in terms of our physical motion, in terms of our career trajectory, Mm -hmm. in terms of the course of this conversation even, right? Yeah. Isn't there some negation necessary in the construction or blazing of these paths? Like, or is your work saying that we need to free ourselves from all negation? Because I feel like that puts you in this realm of just pure potentiality where nothing ever moves forward like we need some of this to move forward great question it's not necessary but it is absolutely implicit right it's a subtle difference so it is necessary in order to we could talk about desire or wanting Uh right so in my mastermind again i talk about these insidious killers where we use Mm -hmm. resistive language to Mm -hmm. create suffering Mm -hmm. so something like saying you should do this right there's a form of judgment and criticism that's implicit in the language of you should Mm-hmm. Even if it's well intended, sure. it could be a loved one. Right. Well, you need to do this, or I have to, right? These languages, yeah. if you feel them, they have constraint, right? Like you have to. It's a prescription, yeah. it's instructive, yeah. but it's also got resistance. It's yeah. not a choice. Right. Versus I teach people you choose to, I get to, or I'd even love to. Uh, yeah. Right. There's yeah. less yeah. resistance there. Right. And so it's not that it's necessary in terms of these choices, but I would assert, again, because of the way I look at this dimension of being human, mm-hmm. is that we're actually here to free ourselves mm. there's two games afoot right there's a human game which is what most people are playing which is i want to amass a bit more wealth mm-hmm. maybe ideally a bit of stat- status right if i can even a bit of power i certainly want to create more 
you know, belongings and possessions. Mm -hmm. And if I can live a nice life and occasionally go on vacation, right? Mm -hmm. This is sort of that linear track. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is a vertical ascension, right? Which is I'm shifting dimensions in terms of my narratives mm -hmm. because I'm overcoming negations. Mm -hmm. So if I'm living in the world of I'm not, a, I'm not good enough or I'm not enough, then it's, you know, ipso factor, it makes sense that if you're somebody who's with decent uh, education and maybe a little bit of resources, you're just going to work harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to, you know, do what your parents right. said. And this is about like, if you want something, go get it. Mm -hmm. But if it's on top of a foundation of I'm not enough, you are, it's sort of the quintessential rubber band tied around a big oak tree and the other end is around your waist. And you have a certain realm of diameter that you can function in. Mm -hmm. If you try really hard, you expand that. Mm -hmm. But then the collapse or the fatigue and the crash is because you're still attached. Right. You're eventually going to come back to your circumference of comfort. Mm. So that's a linear track. What I'm doing is cutting the rubber band. Mm. And now you suddenly step into a new realm. Now that can be disorienting to your point, right? Right, right, right. right? So I say Especially freedom. first. To, yeah. to begin with, and you see this every time I work with someone, I say, I'm introducing you to a world with which you're not familiar. Uh -huh. Now, that presents another problem, right? It's like how to navigate that. Most right. people don't know, and I call it flip-flopping, where right. people go between their old iteration of themselves, yeah. yet having not, not, not being able to see what they just saw, which is a glimpse of pure possibility. Right. And again, one of my quotes is a freedom without structure is chaos, which speaks to your point. Right? right. So what happens, what's incumbent upon the being and certainly your programming is, is once you overcome the negation, which is if I have any IP, I'd say it's a double negation is the way I work. Yeah. Because you can go to any kind of like beautiful, again, like a community, a church, a yoga, spiritual community, and they're like, no, you are good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. People have these affirmations. They look in the mirror and you are a winner. Mm -hmm. But you're saying I'm a winner on top of the fundamental pretense, which is you don't who you are for yourself is you're not. Mm. Otherwise, you wouldn't need the affirmation, mm -hmm. right? Mm. <laughs> so the double negation is, okay, someone thinks they're not enough. What I help them see is you're not, not enough. Mm. So Which is I am enough. Yeah. That's what it reveals. Yes. But not as a declaration so much as a revelatory process of what was already in existence. Mm. Okay. So this right. is like the uh, sculptor removing the stone, revealing the masterpiece. Michelangelo, how mm. did you create the, past, the masterpiece of David out of a lump of marble? He yeah. said, I didn't. David was in there. I chipped away everything that wasn't David. Beautiful. Wow. So that's what I'm doing is I'm chipping away narratives that by design are confronting and, and confining to reveal the essence of who you are, which to me is freedom, love, and possibility is these inherent qualities. Then there's another stage, which is now in the place of this new world with which you're not familiar, which is pure possibility itself. We then get to use language, not be used by language. Oh, okay. So most people are using it. Like, so I, again, a distinction. There's a language we use and there's a language that uses us is the way I term oh. it. Yeah. So the language we use in this case is English. Yeah. But the language that uses us are these subconscious constraints with which you are not familiar because they're blind spots. Mm. But it's using everything that you do because it's how you feel and think as a genesis of that constraint. Mm. So when you reverse engineer, you see the double negation. Oh, I'm not not safe. I'm not not loved. Mm. That's the dissolution. Again, I say I don't solve problems. I dissolve them. Mm. And in the dissolution of a constraint... <laughs> you literally are introduced to what was beneath the surface, which is freedom is, love is, possibility is, worth is. Wow. So that's our inherent, our natural state. Now, the, so, the, so if there were three main buckets, we are confined, we are suffering, we are limited, we're living in fear. You get to see that's not true. Liberation. You witness people in my masterminds, people I work with, it is palpable how touching it is to see a human being. Usually there's a lot of emotion that comes mm -hmm. with it which is the byproduct of all the constraint and suffering, the release is phenomenal in and of itself. Mm. Worth, surprise, worth the price of entry for most humans who are like, oh my God. Hmm. And this was my own experience when I discovered freedom that I didn't even know was available to me. Then the third stage is where we now become creative. So we start to use language, the wardrobes for our soul, but in a conscious process. Mm. So I'm no longer defined by language that I'm oblivious to, which is a reactive state. Uh -huh. And we have compassion for that. I say you can't be held accountable for that which you're oblivious to. Uh -huh. So when people judge somebody for smoking, intellectually they know smoking nowadays, it's, it's written all over the fucking box, right? Uh -huh. People know it's not good for you. What they don't know is why they're still doing it because at the deeper level of their subconscious, there's constraints that create the suffering uh -huh. which they found relief from in nicotine. Uh -huh. So until they deal with the constraint which creates the suffering, they still need the substance. Uh -huh. That's why the ultimate addiction is to the idea of themselves. Wow. The substance is just way downstream. So then when you get to freedom, now you consciously versus reactively, you create 
and I love language, right? So if someone were right now listening, if you write the word reacting on a piece of paper with some decent mm -hmm. spacing, and then you write creating underneath it, mm -hmm. they're both seven letters. Mm -hmm. The only difference is you see from a different place. Mm. reacting is in the middle you have a history that you haven't mm -hmm. yet reconciled and then the C comes at the beginning and now you start to create your future consciously wow you see mm. from a different perspective so there is this deep relationship between freedom and truth it yeah. sounds like that you are yes you said you don't solve problems you dissolve problems dissolve yeah. problems right yeah. yeah negating the negations yes the exactly. double negative is the positive kind of thing and yeah. so the, again, removing the stone that was there and revealing Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. um, and that, what, what is this other thing? I've heard something like truth is like gold. It's like once you wash all away all the falsehood, you know, that's what's left over or something like that. So mm -hmm. what is it? What is this? Is it your, the, the, this is programming that we naturally inherit as a process of maturation and individuation, yep. perhaps, that we are left with this debris I don't know, is the yeah. term that comes to mind of it's different ideas word. and stories and conversations yeah. we've had about ourselves to survive up until this point. And yes. then we, you are then empowering people to step out of that yeah. and, I don't know, wash it away, clean it up, yeah. create something new. Like, yeah. So w the I that's always stepping out of this, that's the real you, right? They Correct. can never really be identified with any of these conversations or interactions. And yeah. there's always the possibility of stepping back. That is the truth of who we are. Correct. That and is that is freedom. So that is that the connection is, between truth and freedom. Yes. So it becomes, act ironically, my work goes through these different stages, but it becomes ultimately impersonal. Mm. So in the absence of the I, or one of my shorter quotes, I say, no you, no problem. Mm-hmm. Every single problem you notice that you have, you're there, right? So it belongs to the narrative that you become misidentified with. So you articulated it beautifully. So in the dissolution process, I'm not giving somebody something. Mm -hmm. I'm helping them reveal what's already been there, always been there. Mm -hmm. I'm helping you see that by seeing what's in the way. So it's a revelatory process. And I would assert, again, without getting too poetic esoteric, this is the dimension of being human. Like our pets, our domesticated animals, our cats and dogs aren't sitting there reflecting on like, well, how come they didn't give me as much food tonight? Right, for right. <laughs> right. You know, right. but as humans, we, I assert, and this is where it gets really deep and it would require the listener to, you know, have some scope of, you know, understanding that this is just my perspective. It's yeah. not necessarily a truth that I assert that we arrive with these constraints. Yeah. It's not because your dad was mean or your mom wasn't present or your dad got divorced with your mom at a young age and... These are, quote, unquote, what we call traumatic experiences right. for the kid that doesn't have any capacity to process. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but again, I'm asking the audience to, you know, sort of go on the ride with me is consider, just consider that you're a boundless spiritual being with this limitless capacity for freedom, love, and all of the, the, the abundance that is your right. true nature. You've incarnated because you've become misidentified, going back to the addiction, yeah. with these constraints. And therefore, you've curated the circumstances of your life, including the parents that you've attracted, who are perfect in order to reveal the constraints such that you can transcend them and ultimately go on to the next level of what it is to be a being. Mm. Right? Mm. So this is, quote, unquote, you know, this one level of what it is to live in the universe. And in this particular paradigm, which is, let's face it, full of trials and tribulations and a bit yeah. of a gong show, especially yeah. now. Yeah. It's perfect for the reflection to be able to reveal the frustrations, the, the constraints and limitations, the fears that we have, that we arrived with, such that we can transcend them to ultimately emancipate ourselves from this dimension. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it's not so, because people live in the victim world, even though they might declare they're not a victim, they live in the victim world so readily. And to me, it's a binary thing. It's an on or off switch. You're either fully responsible for your existence or you're a victim. Uh -huh. And if anyone's right now listening and go, well, yeah, but you didn't know my dad and he used to beat the shit out of us. Uh -huh. I don't condone that behavior. It's abhorrent. Right. There's things right. that happen to human beings that really piss me off, sure. right? Sure. It's disgusting. And we've seen it in the last few years for sure. But who you are today with whatever you're con dealing with, speaking to the person who might have this stereotypical tough dad, isn't because of your dad. Uh -huh. I would assert, and it, again, it takes a right. big mind and someone who's willing to take responsibility and get out of victimhood, is that you were a being who arrived, curated a type of father who was, in this case, you know, had some hostility, anger, and frustration, 
that then turned on in you whatever it is that mm. I'm not worthy, I'm not loved, I'm a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. And then you have, from that particular foundation, created the identity in the way that you survive society. Mm. You either go into it and then maybe somebody gets, you know, becomes a drug addict or drinks right. a lot. They become sort of mercurial and, and aggressive in their relationships or they try to mitigate that. So I'm never going to be like my dad with my kids, right. which ironically is a reaction. Therefore, you are being like your dad. You're just being the other side of the same. Yeah, coin. they either imitate or they counter imitate kind of yes, thing. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So that's a much headier philosophical way of looking at the human experience. But it's also a very empowering one because if it really was because your dad, your boss, your wife, your whatever, right. then now you've you've created this disempowering relationship to life where you're a victim of something. Victim of circumstances. Yeah, versus yeah. you are the author or the cause of your experience. Not necessarily right. the events. There's a certain degree right. of things can sure. happen based on your energy. Right. But certainly in the way that you, quote, unquote, respond. Most people don't respond. So again, in those three buckets I talked yeah. about earlier, most people are in a reactive state. Right. Something happens, they react, which yeah. is a threat response. Right. Yeah. Especially when people get really upset. Yeah, it's there's a perceived threat to what their narrative, their view. Yeah, it's not yeah. like a really. It's usually not a life threatening situation. Right. right. Yeah. You know, again, yeah. I quote, I say, if it's not life threatening, it's just ego threatening. Mm. Mm-hmm. When you get that, you can. A lot of people will be like, oh shit. You know, I do a lot of ego threatening stuff. So it's reactive. Once you get out of the negation of self, now you get into a responsive, mm-hmm. response able, mm-hmm. responsible. Mm-hmm. And then we can start to dabble with creative, where I'm consciously creating through the lens of my own narrative a view that will give rise to the manifestation of a life that I'm declared that I'm t- uh, dedicated to. Fascinating. The farm at Okifinoki is a revolutionary new regenerative agricultural community. It features an 8,000 tree olive orchard, which they use to make their own olive oil, as well as a very large pecan orchard. All the animals on the farm are heritage animals, with some varieties over 100 years old and others thousands of years old. Fresh eggs are produced daily by the farm's chickens. Also, there are over 1,000 beehives that pollinate the over 200 heirloom fruits and vegetables and provide honey to all the residents. The farm makes its own molasses, unrefined sugar, herbs, and spices. The farm also features an herbal apothecary and a commercial kitchen. These are just a few reasons why the farm is the healthiest place on earth. To learn more about the healthiest place on earth, go to okefarm.com and use discount code BREEDLOVE for $21,000 off custom cabin pricing. Again, to learn more about the farm at Okefenokee, Go to okefarm.com and be sure to tell them I sent you. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, And even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. I'd like to thank my friends at Swan Bitcoin for their long-standing support of the What Is Money show. Swan's mission is to help millions of people get into Bitcoin, so they built the best solution to set up recurring Bitcoin buys and automatic withdrawals into cold storage. With the Swan app, it takes just two minutes to sign up and start buying Bitcoin. If you're a new customer, you get $10 in free Bitcoin for signing up, and the first $10,000 of Bitcoin you buy incurs zero fees. If you're an existing Swan customer, then the next $10,000 of Bitcoin you buy now incurs zero fees. So if you love to recommend Bitcoin to friends and family, then Swan is the best place to start. So go to swanbitcoin.com slash breedlove to get started today. Again, that's swanbitcoin.com slash breedlove. So obviously, 
the nature and philosophy of language is very important to this entire enterprise. Yeah. Um, you said that words are the wardrobe of the soul. Yes. Um, that's obviously a, a metaphor, right? I, mm -hmm. that, and something I'm very deeply fascinated by. I'm writing a long essay right now that metaphor is much more than what we think it is. It's yeah. Much more than just a linguistic device. I think it's actually a conceptual device. Yeah. By which we think of one thing in terms of another thing. Like we look at something that we don't understand in terms of something that we do understand mm -hmm. to try and gain a deeper understanding of the thing we don't understand. Absolutely. So can we dig into that metaphor a little yeah. bit? Like when you say words are the wardrobe of the soul, like what is it about, well, I guess, wardrobes or clothing that mm -hmm. makes that such an apt metaphor for the nature of language? Again, I think using the example of the bottle of water, right? Like we can understand that water will take on the shape of the container. Yeah. So if we look at water synonymous in this case with the soul that really can take on any shape, yeah. then I would assert that language is what determines the shape. So I was just working with a, a client slash friend recently who she's going through some stuff with, with her partner and I've helped them with regards to what they're working on. And I left a message for her voice member. She'd left something they were struggling with. And she said, wow, as you spoke, she said the image, to your point about, it doesn't have to be language, but it's programming mm -hmm. and visuals, visualizations can be a form of programming. She said, I felt like I was one of these wine barrels. And she said, and all those metal rings started to just crack and they mm -hmm. burst. And she said, that was the amount of freedom and expansiveness that I started to feel. Mm -hmm. So... She's using words to describe the image, but for her, words were redundant. She had the image, and that gave rise. It elicited the feeling, mm. right? So that is where we are ultimately looking for a feeling, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you were to go up to anyone on the street, right. especially as this is your domain of expertise, and say, you've got one wish, what are most people going to wish for, right? It's in the realm of money, right? Yeah. Most people are going to say, I want a million bucks yeah. nowadays. So it's so redundant much. because if <laughs> it ain't much, right? <laughs> Especially this day and age with the fact that they keep printing it. But anyway, that's that's the domain. So, But here's the rub. Again, it's a lie. Because you, if you gave them a million bucks and you locked them in a car, or you put them under the stairs and they'd be miserable. Yeah. But, but why are you not happy? That's what you said you wanted. Uh, so do you right. see, people are actually always speaking ultimately to an experience they want. They want a feeling. Right, right, right. So it's what the million bucks in this case represents. Right. Because even in this case, if you were to then continue the conversation, say, have you ever had a million bucks? Yeah. Most people can say no. Okay, well then how do you know that's what you want? Mm -hmm. So you see, it's interesting, right? You're actually appealing to the fact that they, through intuition, imagination, or whatever they've got. Or imitation. Imitation. Yeah. They're under the impression that that's going to give them something that they feel they're lacking but they have to feel it in order to know that that's what they're pursuing right so here's the rub they already have what they're looking for they're just under the impression which is the illusion of time yeah that they can't access it now until circumstances change right that's a victim mindset yeah i'll be okay when right and in most cases my husband my wife my mom my dad if they change i'll be fine right Right. But now you're at the mercy of other humans and circumstances, which, as I said, is you're basically at the effect of life. Mm. And what I'm introducing people to, at least as a consideration, as a possibility, is to be the person who is actually creating your experience, mm -hmm. regardless of the circumstances of your life. That starts to dabble now with power. And what I would assert is true success, because I've worked with multiple billionaires that I wouldn't say are successful, but they have a lot of money. Right. Because to me, success is synonymous with peace. All right. Okay. True success is somebody who's at peace. To be at peace, you have to recognize, first of all, the constraints with which you are currently bound. Yeah. Because nobody's happy in prison. Right. Right. Which yeah. is really what's happening for people, albeit psychologically. You know, this is the ultimate form of uh, incarceration. Right. As your own narrative right. based in negations. So to be at peace, you have to break out of that, which is why I'd say freedom, truth, and peace, and love are all sort of bedfellows. They're all synonymous, yeah. different words to point to a different experience, which is really, again, I come back to my main product, which is freedom. Right. To be free from the constraints with which you arrived, which if you're an artist or in any industry, is the tapestry upon which you now get to create versus be it the, the whim or the, be it the effect of something that's already there. Right. It's like the great line in the uh, Matrix, right, which I'm sure you've seen. When he goes to see the Oracle and the kids are like, you know, they're sort of uh, moving these uh, cubes. Telekinesis. And can telekinesis. And then the kid is like bending the spoon. Uh. Such a powerful line because he says, 
don't try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Mm. Just realize there is no spoon. <laughs> now, if you really get that, Right. Uh, because if you think there's a spoon, you've already created reality. Uh, and it's you that now you're fighting because you have an understanding of what a spoon is. Uh, now, just take that to everyday life. If you think your spouse, your mom is a certain way. Right. Even with the best of intentions, oh, I went to this workshop, I read this book, I'm going to help my mom. But you already have an image of who your mom is. Right. So you're actually not fighting her, the other being, who's a sovereign entity. Right. You're fighting your relationship to her, which is you with you, which creates all the frustration in the world. Incredibly subtle. Um, <laughs> so, so subtle. So subtle. I have to ask yeah. you, so another yeah. thing that's very <clears throat> fascinating to me in this sphere of language and mm -hmm. money is the nature of incentives. And what, uh, I, what I hear you saying, like this idea of transcending your own viewpoint to go yeah. from reactive to creative, for instance. Yeah. But there's still feedback the other direction, right? Like we're all incentive responsive creatures. Yeah. So how do, how do material incentives fit into your worldview of where the individual that is self-authoring or creating the world around them, obviously there's limitations, right? We can't, meditate and make the sun go backwards or something. Yeah. Um, how do material incentives fit into that framework? I mean, like anything, it's all relative to your perspective. Mm. You give, if you went, if we went to Brunei right now, and gave the Sultan of Brunei a brand new Ferrari, he'd be like, <laughs> give it to my cousin. Right. He's got yeah. 15 of them in yeah. his garage. Yeah. Right. Like, so it's all relativity again, yeah. relative to perspective. Right. You go to somebody on the street who's struggling and they're working three jobs and making 30 grand a year yeah. and they're exhausted. You give them a Ferrari. They, there might be the initial reaction. No, 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 no. You've got the wrong person. <laughs> right. Like I, their language, their narrative is I died. Did, no, they don't deserve it. Did I win a competition? Yeah, but I don't yeah. deserve that. Yeah. Again, there's no truth there, but that is their reality, which will give rise to the reality that they keep perpetuating. Interesting. So the whole world of materialism is invariably just like anything, relationships, health, yeah. an extension of the you that you are for yourself based in this deep code. Right. So when you get to a place, you know, I for sure, being completely honest, like anybody when I was younger, I was enamored with the world of materialism. Of right. Because that's where we as collective, like money, mm -hmm. we ascribe value. Yeah. The more I discover through my own processes, and I'm a work in progress like anybody else, I might be at the bow of the boat a little more than some people so that I can lead or at least, you know, mm -hmm. teach, um, is the more I discover the true value of what it is to be human, which is to be free. And as I said earlier, true mm -hmm. success is to be at peace. Mm -hmm. I have started to truly lose interest in possessions mm -hmm. other than there's a certain degree of beauty, you know, sure. to have a nice home, to be able to right. finish it nicely with beautiful furniture. Yeah. It becomes a degree of function. You know, I used to be, I could say, like a recovering perfectionist, certainly when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, wait, it's not so much that things have to be a certain way, which would be the underlying subtext of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. There's no choice. There's the insidious killers. It has to be that way. Mm -hmm. Then you start to introduce choice, which is more creative versus reactive. It's like, I have a preference for excellence or beauty. Right. It's very different than it has to be. Right. There's no freedom in right. things have to be There's a certain no force there. It's an OCD. It's like an actual disorder. It's right. corrupt. You've right. corrupted the software. You've got a virus in this right. case where you're not at peace with the way things are. So now, you know, maybe it's a certain degree of, you know, just becoming older, but I, I hope, you know, to a certain degree wiser and certainly freer, which is you start to realize the absolute meaningless of stuff. Uh -huh. And you start to become much more, at least I do, interested in the quality of life hmm. the quality of connection the quality of presence mm -hmm. of being where you are versus trying to be where you're not mm. and most people are trying to be where they're not and then they wonder why they suffer yeah it's such a delicate dance right like mm -hmm. um the power of presence but then you can't Obviously, from a practical standpoint, you can't just be meditating and present all the time, right? You have to get out of bed and make plans. And you know. But even the language, you don't have to. Right. That's There's an underlying implication there that if you don't, you don't pay bills, you can't pay rent, blah, blah, which is, again, there's right. consequences of all sure. choices. But at least if you get out of the realm of have to, like there are people, to whatever degree, I haven't seen them, who sit in caves in the Himalayas yeah, and they just meditate yeah, sure. and they're trying to raise the frequency right. of the planet. Yeah. So you could say that yeah. they're doing it, you yeah. know. And again, you go to certain countries, like we could probably retire and go to, you know, Bali or the Philippines or right. whatever. So there's no have to, 
it occurs that way. That's yeah. how it occurs. Gotcha. You don't have to pay taxes. Right. And some argue that you literally don't. Like, yeah. it's a completely corrupt system. Yeah. And if you had all the resources and the great attorneys, maybe you wouldn't. Yeah. But there are consequences. Yeah. You don't have to stay in the speed limit. I know because I have a point on my license. Right. <laughs> but there are consequences. <laughs> right. 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 So, again, we just start to enter the realm of real choice versus yeah. figures of choice. Conscious creativity versus unconscious reactivity. These are yeah. very different domains. It's uh, this reminds me of my mom passed away recently, but she has a, she had a lot of redneck wisdom that she used to share, and she had the saying that stuff don't matter, people do. Yeah, it's like one of these kind of redneck kind of see things she used to say, but yeah. it's like sort of resonates with what you're saying. Like ultimately, yeah. when you're on your deathbed, you're going to reflect upon the relationships you had, the connections you had, the moments you had with those people that you loved, yeah, the things you owned and possessed, right? And as an and in there, some of the things that you will reflect on and remember and cherish are the moments you had with people because of the space you had, the vacation yeah, you went right. on that did require a building sure. or an Airbnb sure. or you bought a nice house in Europe. Or, yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. it's, it's both, right? Yeah. We want to make space. We just don't want to lean on one or the other as though that's where it's at. Right. And if we come from a place of freedom as opposed to being reactive to life and thinking things need to be a certain way, yeah. you start to now create a beautiful life yeah. an extraordinary life which you're just not attached to them i think there's a great line from gandhi where they you know were sitting in satsang and they were asking about but how do i emancipate all my belongings mm -hmm. you know and he said you don't you just have to emancipate yourself from the you that thinks those belongings are important mm. right then you can have all the trappings in the world you're just no longer attached as though that's where your value resides right okay it's a very different relationship so this is a I'm, I'm sensing like a continuum here right where we have language on one end of the spectrum and then obviously the self is well there's this the i guess capital s capital self, s that's self. beyond the conversation yeah right your deepest prior to, i prior to language then there's like the conversational overlay for that self yeah the container and then there's the the way we relate to others and the material world which is some composite of language and money and property and all these things in between and commensurate with the small s self right yeah but so is it people then in there and i want to get into the topic of ego now is okay it, that ego is somehow putting the emphasis on the wrong uh, gradient of that spectrum of who they are, whether they think they are, you know, their possessions or they think they are their job or they think they are whatever. Yeah. Rather than realizing they are this, you know, uh, deepest free being that can select all of these things. Yes. So ego gets a bad rap, right? And again, again, these are all just, just in case this wasn't clear as a disclaimer, like mm -hmm. I'm just sharing a perspective. I'm, yeah. an, I'm a walking perspective, right? Right. right. So another of this is category. You're a sitting truth. perspective. Yeah, I'm a sitting perspective. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to be specific with Megra. <laughs> Thank you. Occasionally walking, occasionally lying. <laughs> Sometimes running. <laughs> um, but the conversation of ego has gotten a bad rap, right? Just like healthcare, people think has got to do with health, although more and more mm -hmm. people are waking up saying in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So ego to me is synonymous with persona, identity, the facade that we present to the world, the ambassador mm -hmm. of us. All right. It's really just a locator in time and space of who I am. It's helpful that people can know that you're Rob or Robert. Yeah. If they see you walking down the street and they say, hey, Robert, you know, it's gracious. You could say polite that you respond because you know that's sort of referring to you mm -hmm. as the identity. You know, if you're completely, to your point earlier, if you're completely free, <laughs> there's no real direction right, right you, you right, just right, sort of right. drift in the world of pure yeah. possibility yeah so that ego isn't bad it's just we want to look at where is that ego by design and through language confined mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. personas like peter crone still has a persona i made up the title of the mind architect mm -hmm. it's helpful it's a mm -hmm. container for me to step into it's a brand. It. it breeds curiosity yeah. versus saying yeah. i'm a spiritual teacher or i'm a life coach right, right, right. you know Again, that's why I said it's for now in this lifetime and who knows what I might be inspired by in five to ten years mm -hmm. and I become something else right. in terms of a moniker. Right. But really, if I would articulate myself from the perspective of who I see myself to be, I'd say, you know, I'm pure potentiality. I'm the space of unconditional love, freedom, and, and possibility. Mm -hmm. right? But that's not necessarily helpful for somebody who just wants to improve their health or relationship or financial status. Right. Yeah. right? So... The ego is really just that which we become misidentified with. Mm. However, in this material world, three-dimensional time mm -hmm. and space, it's a helpful place for us to become located. Mm -hmm. 
really the invitation is to look at which parts of the ego are creating your suffering and disease, disease. Right. And then that part of the ego, it's no different than the structure of the building where it's lost integrity. If somebody takes their car into a dealership to look at, okay, there's the car, but which parts of the car aren't functioning optimally? Mm -hmm. So just as in this day and age, I particularly love health. You know, I'm speaking at different biohacking events, health optimization. I do all the things, contrast therapies and mm -hmm. saunas and cold plunge and hyperbaric chambers. Like I like to take care of my equipment. Mm -hmm. It's an optimization process. Mm -hmm. So we could say that my work is about optimizing the identity or the ego. Mm. And how do we do that? We remove the constraints. Where are you, quote unquote, limiting yourself unbeknownst to you, hence compassion, but in terms of what you want to aspire to? You'd mm -hmm. love to create a beautiful, loving, harmonious relationship. Right. You'd love to create uh, an abundance of wealth. You want to create vitality in your body. Those things become inaccessible if the ego is looking through a lens of constraint. Mm. certainly less attainable mm -hmm. so that's really where ego gets a bad rap uh, again i jokingly say that the, the the part of you that's trying to get rid of the ego is the ego mm. <laughs> so is the the ego then something like the avatar of the meat suit in yeah a way? that we need a linguistic representation of the meat suit it's to... kind of the software that's right. running the show okay. yeah it's the i it's the when people say i Right. And we all do. Right. You know, it's again a construct in language right. where it's saying, like, I'm over here, you're over there. So right. this I, the way that I look at things yeah. is, you know, and to whatever degree th those perspectives really butt heads, people yeah. kill each other. Right. You know, my God, my yes. invisible, fictitious right. character right. that I speak to yeah. is better than your God. And so we're going to go to war. Wow. You start to realize the insanity. Right. Of like, we're fighting over illusory images in this case, and the same mm -hmm. is true in politics to whatever. But what about when people are fighting over material goods, which is, I think, what they are typically ultimately fighting over, even if they say they're fighting over a god or a nation is typically over the stuff. Like, is that just well, what our really basic animalistic thing? Our fight or flight, pure yeah. survival, kill or be killed. Yeah, These are yeah. primal to our DNA. But if you really look at it, they're fighting over an opinion. Mm. When you really break it down... Because again, the Sultan of Brunei, a Ferrari, which someone might fight over in an auction or whatever, if it was a particular price, for him, it's meaningless. Right. So there's no fight from his perspective. You know, just Black Friday at JCPenney's, I can't imagine how many fights that have. Yeah. Because, you know, this particular skirt, t shirt, yeah. or whatever that's on sale, somebody else saw. I mean, look at toilet paper. Yeah. yeah, yeah and people yeah, are fighting possibly, over right. toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. They're not fighting over toilet paper. What are they fighting over? The beliefs. Survival. Of, yeah. The threat of their own existence. Right. There's absolutely no rationale in terms of fighting over toilet paper. Yeah. I mean, there's a myriad of different ways that they could deal with the fact that they might have some, you know, without getting too grotesque, <laughs> remnants of feces yeah, that's yeah. stuck between their butt cheeks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like you yeah. take a fucking garden hose, you know, <laughs> or eat a better diet, in yeah. which case you normally don't need toilet paper because yeah. you process food beautifully. <laughs> I know you get on that diet. <laughs> <laughs> You've never had the like no wipers uh, occasionally, but <laughs> yeah, not consistently. Yeah, well, because again, most people are in a state of fight or flight because their ego is in a threat response. If you're in threat response, you're in sympathetic mode, which means that you're not digesting properly. Mm. So you could eat all the best food in the world, but your digestion is not a priority because your brain is telling you there's something to look out for. That's mm. the ego in its state of suffering and fear. Yeah. So that's why most people have health issues because digestion is really the precursor to all our vitality. Right. And not so much what you eat, you're, you know, what you digest and then fundamentally right. absorb and me metabolize right. at the cellular level. But why most people are sick is because, you know, to really look at the cascade, their identity, based mm -hmm. on some constraint and negation, I'm not this, I'm not that, means that they are usually 24-7 in a mild to severe state of fight or flight. Mm -hmm. If you're in that sympathetic part of the autonom autonomic nervous system, digestion is not a priority. Huh. It's just not. This is why sleep is compromised. This is why people's adrenals are shot. The myriad of different diseases we have is mm -hmm. an extension over time of dis-ease that's been in your system. So now, to come back full circle, this is why you need toilet paper. Because uh. <laughs> you're not digesting your food properly. So I see, like, <laughs> I, like, one of my favorite Instagram accounts is Nature is Metal. I don't know if you okay, follow this account. That. It's just um, basically scenes of animals doing stuff in nature, typically killing and eating one another, right? Right, yeah. Um, yeah. Not always that, but often that. Yeah, and they uh, can be pretty brutal. Yeah. yeah, so nature is very, there's a brutality to nature, right, that animals are fighting over territory or food or whatever the thing may mm -hmm. be. Um, I would assume that that animals tend to be sub, 
narrativization about themselves and the way we're talking about here. So is there this aspect of human nature that we are part animal, that we do have the natural combat that is, is that even eradicable? I mean, obviously we've come a long ways, but um, is, is any of this work, I guess, aimed at eradicating sort of human on human violence in that way for sure i don't know if it's aimed at it's like a conscious intention i think for me particularly i can only speak for myself my driving force and my passion and we could argue purpose is you know i'm a bit of a softy right like i just don't like to see people suffer Mm -hmm. and if i have the access or the capacity to through language through holding a space of love which Mm -hmm. a lot of people haven't even experienced right like real love, which we could say is synonymous with profound acceptance for somebody who they are and who they're not. That to me is the default, the sort of mm. by, you know, sheer dumb luck, you eradicate violence and hostility and mm. disharmony and dysfunction. But that is, you know, I say love is the effortless byproduct of ending the illusion of separation. Mm. Right. So love is, but when we get out of the realm of separation, which is very difficult because by design, the ego is this separate entity. Like right. I can't look through Robert's perspective. Right, right, right. We can share it. And this right. is the beauty of relationships if people know how to listen. And language. In language. Yeah. And if you can really get someone's reality, I would assert it's one of the most beautiful things you can do for another human being. Right. Most people in my, again, when I work with people, I talk about these three qualities or three experiences that everyone's looking for. They want to be seen. Yeah. They want to be heard. Right. And they want to be held. Wow. That's it. Yeah, I was just thinking to be understood, that feeling of being understood is satisfying, right? When someone gets you or understands where you're coming from. And women do this way better than men. Yeah. Women with women, when they listen to their girlfriend who's gone through a breakup, who's had some heartache, Mm -hmm. whose parents have just passed, who've got fired, they don't try and come up with a solution. Right. They're like, well, listen, I've got this friend of mine. He's got a new job. He's got a startup. Maybe I can get you a job there. She's like, I'm just sad. Right, 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 right. I'm scared. Always in solution space, right? Yeah. <laughs> so women do this intuitively way better. And this yeah. is why the maternal, especially when it comes to a kid who falls, you know, I always talk about these different types of love. Maternal is usually where I would say start there. Yeah. And even try and in, in sort of inspire my men or invite them to consider that you have that capacity. Yeah. You may not be well um, versed in it, but the maternal is it's all accepting. Yeah. Then the paternal can come in and go, okay, well, Johnny, the reason you fell off your bike and hurt yourself is because you were going too fast given the tightness of the corner and your tires are too, you know, it becomes very practical and analytical. Goes from heart to mind kind of thing. Very helpful. And it might mean that Johnny doesn't scrape himself next time, but not appropriate when he's crying on the pavement. This reminds me of that saying that people don't care what you think until they know that you care. Yes. Because you have to kind of show the love first before you give the prescription. Yes. So I would say we start there, then the world that we live in, which let's face it is, you know, very patriarchal, which tends to be this sort of like left brain, which is all linear, it's all control, it's all power, is why we have this violence and hostility. Yeah. Because it's not from the heart. It's yeah. not from a place of unconditionality. Yeah. So the violence that we see in these wars and whether it be in the house or between nations yeah. or between yeah. religions is really because people are being driven by these fundamental constraints, which is a threat response. It's right. the it is the ultimate corruption of the soul. So this, I mean, you, because these are base level animal instincts that we're trying to overcome, yep. really, right? I, I even rewrite some of this experience to become more human in a way, right? Less, mm-hmm. less animalistic. So yeah, the ego is a instinctual concept or it's a conceptual concept. I'm not sure, but w- I guess, it, yeah, well, we talked about this a little bit offline, but like, uh, the saber, I I perceive the ego as oh the grizzly bear jumps in the living room and we I run that's my ego making me run that way right. you distinguish between kind of your yeah instinctual responses versus your egoic responses so how do you how do those things relate like our base level animal instincts to our ego great so if we were to keep it real simple and again again this is just my perspective is if we look at the different like the evolutionary stages of the brain right mm-hmm. from reptilian to mammalian to like this prefrontal cortex right. that distinguishes us. That realm, I'd say the ego lives in language, which is real prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. Bear runs into the room, it's more mammalian, right? Like, you know, instincts tend to be more reptilian, right? In terms of intuition and feeling things. But pure fight or flight, like the nature's medal or whatever they Mm -hmm. count, you Mm -hmm. said, where you're seeing this pure instinctual form of survival. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like, ah, you know what? 
that gazelle over there is a good. I know they've got family. They've just had babies. Mm -hmm. Like the lions are not thinking that way. The lions like I need food. I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. There's no narrative about it. It's pure instinct. So I would say that lives in the animalistic mammalian. Yeah. So of course we have that. Yeah. We see it in a bar, you know, some dude looks at his girlfriend and yeah. his, right. his quote unquote ego is the threat response yeah. of his feeling of inadequacy, which is really just what's happening. But his mammalian instinct is like, don't touch my quote unquote, my partner in this yeah. case. And that can lead to a brawl. But the transcendence of all of that is, I think, totally possible. I've seen it. And mm. that does, you know, maybe sounds utopian and idealistic give rise to a harmonious world where people Mm. aren't in one suffering Mm. but two aren't in dysfunction or certainly aren't at a state of dis-ease whether it be within Mm. themselves or society Mm. again call me a dreamer i'm not the only one i mean i think if you look at the arc of human history it would support your argument right Mm. that we have we have improved ourselves right we are less violent we are less animalistic we are more civilized i mean it's all around us right open history at some level yeah. some level we could argue that the fights that we have now are more subtle and insidious true right it may not true. be so kind of bloody and spears and yeah. you know fisticuffs but there's a lot of like that finding right. that's a right. different form of manipulation yeah. and domination which is still ego driven because coming from the mindset of scarcity yeah which i would say is ego versus instinct yeah you know that's where we see Again, this corruption yeah. that is based on the mindset of lack and inadequacy mm-hmm. or insecurity that through just more, you know, subtle and seemingly sophisticated means, the few get to, quote unquote, control the masses. Right, right, right. It's still a form of warfare. We That's, could argue without, again, sounding poetic, it's a war for the soul. Yes, yes, yes. War These for the mind, war for the soul, for yeah. sure. Um, this sounds something like an effort to construct or elevate the construction of moral sentiments in human beings, right? The, mm-hmm. um, telling ourselves new stories, you know, coming from a place of abundance rather than lack, yeah. viewing one another as one consciousness, like yeah. that, you know, not viewing the other as less than, uh, less than or inferior to, yeah. it sounds a lot like the cultivation of morality to me. Is it, what, what is the relationship of your work to morality? I, I tend not to make any correlations. To me, I'm really more of a physicist, mm-hmm. you know, like meaning if somebody's looking through a lens of I'm not enough, depending on how they tend to adapt to that constraint mm-hmm. or negation, they may become a people pleaser that we could say in a moralistic sense is like, that's a good person. They become a great waiter. Mm-hmm. They become a great servant. They mm-hmm. become a great nurse and a, but right. they're still in a state of suffering. So as it relates to the collective, there's really, it hasn't budged the needle in terms of us becoming a more harmonious society. It just mm-hmm. looks that way. It gives mm-hmm. the occurrence of that. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like getting beyond even that, which would be a moralist, like be a good person. You know, that to a certain degree is really entrenched in the indoctrination of that into kids through schools and families of don't do this, do this. Mm-hmm. It, it's still robotic. It's not until such time that you become tapped into your own natural instincts, like the monk picking up the scorpion, yeah. which is to come from kindness, to come right. from compassion, which itself is hard to attain because there has to be a certain degree in terms of the hierarchy of needs where you've got shelter, you've mm-hmm. got food, you've got some degree of safety, because otherwise it's hard to adopt those more philanthropic states mm-hmm. when you are just trying to make it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there are people out there right now, and this is where I have compassion, who are just literally physically trying to survive. Sure. They don't know when they're going to get them their the next meal. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I can sound as beautifully poetic as, you know, the next guy. Right. But they're like, well, how the fuck does that help me to get like a little bit more money to pay rent that's due? You know, so yeah. that's where I want to have compassion and we want to sure. make space for not sound like we're sitting up here in our ivory towers, but it's still the same principles apply. Right. Meaning whoever that person is who's struggling, I promise you they're confined not by their circumstances, but those are the byproducts of the real constraints which are between their ears. Yeah, and the, man, the pernicious part of this perhaps is that if people actually did adopt these principles and embody these principles, well, mm-hmm. then there would be more wealth per capita. People could pay rent more easily. People would so be less more. poverty, et cetera. Yeah, but it's how do you persuade people to adopt those principles and not act on their animalistic urges, right? It's yeah, it's almost like the eternal tension in trying to pull humanity from animal to human in yeah. a way. Yeah, certainly 
compassionate, free, kind, loving human. Yes. And again, it's not so much convince the masses, because I think the masses, if we look at even what happened in the last few yeah. years, I never used the word evil, right? I was always based mm-hmm. on my understanding of human psyches and behaviors. You know, a guy who's being abusive or a girl who's being abusive in a relationship, it's not that they're a bad person. Mm-hmm. It's just if you were to walk every day of their life from the you know, the day they arrived, you would understand that because of the abuse, the language that they learned, right? I said earlier, right. there's a language you use and there's a language that uses us, meaning the condition of the environment mm-hmm. they were brought up in. You don't condone their behavior, but you can understand it. Right. So then we have some, as I said, like much more compassion. Mm-hmm. So when you when you understand that, I think for the most part, people are good. Yeah. Right? Humans just want to hopefully maybe have a family, raise some kids, go on vacation and mm-hmm. just live a decent life where they can, as animalistic sort of tendencies, mm-hmm. avoid pain and yeah. have some degree of pleasure. Yeah. Where I think it gets a little bit more, uh, again, to corruption and insidiousness is that it's the few controlling the many mm. who aren't interested in this conversation because mm-hmm. they don't want to acquiesce or give up their compensation for scarcity, which is power and control mm-hmm. and wealth. Right. So they're the ones that need to adopt it more more so. And right. so that's where, to come back to my point, evil, it's a strong word. And again, I don't subscribe to any particular religion and obviously this world of duality and mm-hmm. good and evil and Satan mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's the first time I've entertained that there are people out there who have sufficient intelligence that may even know some of their constraints. Mm-hmm. But even in the face of that, they ignore the understanding of what this world of freedom and abundance is on the other side of that, and they still are dedicated Mm -hmm. to the reactive qualities of an ego, albeit somewhat consciously. That, to me, Mm -hmm. then becomes malintent. Mm -hmm. You know, there's somebody who gets angry. Yeah. There's there's another energy where someone's angry, but then they use blame. Mm. Right? So there's, I feel angry, Mm -hmm. sovereign being, I own it. Right. It's your fault. Now that becomes hostility and animosity. Yes. So now you're you're this is you're sort of starting to ascribe your state Mm -hmm. through blame, guilt, and shaming of another human being. Mm. That's that is now outside of the world of responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. And this happens all the time in relationships. So likewise, the people in the power of whatever it politics, government, Mm -hmm. finance, who are using the same mechanisms of control but they know what they're doing, mm-hmm. that now to me starts to at least fall under the umbrella of being, evil's a strong word, but it's certainly malintent. It's malicious, yeah, right? Versus we look at people that we've all looked through the decades and centuries that we've, you know, we've recognized these beautiful inspirational leaders who had the best of intentions for mm-hmm. humanity. Mm-hmm. They're the people that I think we're most drawn to and we're inspired by. Yes. So. That's what I'm appealing to is hopefully some of my words. And I know because I work with some great leaders who do change the culture of their companies. They certainly change the dynamics of their family where, you know, the wife is texting me weeks later and they're like, I don't know what you said to my husband, but we've never been so in love. Or, you know, Mm. these are these are beautiful things to be able to see. And that's a microcosm of what, again, perhaps I'm a dreamer, but I feel that we can create as a culture. But as I say, you know, we can't create, well, peace if people are at war within themselves. Mm. So until we address that internal battle, these mm. internal constraints, these imprisoned uh, exp- experiences of our narratives, mm. then we can appeal to the masses and we can protest all day and get down on one knee in whatever major city. Mm. But you still go home and you have a disagreement with your spouse or you make them wrong for something. The mm. same energy exists within the walls of your own comfort mm. of your own house. So, so, that- so better to focus on the people that are actually in leadership positions such that the then they would propagate by imitation rather than that's to, one way right yeah. the other way is like you know speak with your wallet as people say and yeah. like you know these right. these corporations okay. are going to follow the yeah. trends so right. you know energetically you know speak with your quote-unquote narratives right? right like who are you can you kill them with kindness can whatever expression embody your mind. philosophy yeah where you come yourself where you're not a victim of circumstance because otherwise you're in the kill or be killed mm. you know we all and myself included even in my life, in my relationships, in my health, like mm-hmm. I choose to be responsible for where did I contribute yeah. to whatever was a co-created experience. And that's yeah. not always easy to look at. It takes yeah. a big human being to go, you know what? I can see why this happened or why somebody had this particular mm-hmm. reaction. It's just most people don't want to be that responsible. Right. Because sometimes it's too painful to look at. 
because they really then have to look at these old scars from their childhood where they really feel that who they are is trash a piece of shit nobody yeah. wants them or they're not loved or they're not good enough and that's really that's difficult to look at the dark places it is until you realize they're not dark places they're conversations that give rise to the corruption of our soul wow. and the liberation this this is why uh um joseph campbell had that great quote right he said the treasure you seek is in the cave that you fear to enter yes right right so meaning that these shadows these narratives based in constraint as discomforting as they are the freedom that we all look for and that we all crave desperately is on the other side of the limitations that currently most people are oblivious to. That's, and that is that to me is the opportunity is to be a human. And it intuitively makes sense, right? That the well, the places you are most blind to would be the most painful to look at and yeah. also be the most revelatory, right? Obviously. Yeah. The things you don't see are going to reveal the most to you. Yeah. When you look at them. That's, that's uh, why they're called blind spots. And yeah. I really I really believe that is the true game of what it is to be human. Let me ask you one question about that parable of the monk picking up the scorpion. Yeah. So if a critic were to say, well, that monk is just a fool, why does mm-hmm. he keep extending the compassionate hand to the predatory scorpion that keeps stinging him? Mm-hmm. How would you answer that? Um, it's just a parable to make a point. <laughs> like my should story. We Im- I mean, should we imitate that monk or, or even advocating for that? No, I think it's like any of these things, like even my work. It's a pointer to something, mm-hmm. right? It's not an emphatic fact. This isn't like the 10 rules based on Peter Crone. Right. You know, you, you're going to be making the choices that you make. Right. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a, a great story from um, uh, Ramana Maharshi. Mm-hmm. People used to go to his ashram and in satsang, meaning, you know, the teacher would sit there, the guru, and people ask questions. And he used this great analogy where people walk with varying degrees of damp gunpowder. Uh-huh. So he said, I'm saying the same thing to everybody. And there's 100, 10, 1,000, how many people? Uh-huh. And he said, imagine that your palm is filled with gunpowder. He said, some people arrive and the gunpowder is completely submerged. Uh-huh. So whatever insights, distinctions, and forms of inspiration and wisdom that he's declaring and sharing, it might look like nothing has, quote, unquote, happened for that person. Mm-hmm. They don't walk away with any, like, huge epiphanies or insights. They don't change their behavior. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, to a certain degree, the water has been evaporated a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then the other scale, at the other end of the continuum, somebody walks in with bone-dry gunpowder. Mm-hmm. The same message of insight, inspiration, and wisdom mm-hmm. ignites a huge spark of realization in gotcha. So this is where we can have compassion again, that everyone's where they're at and they are curating the events that are appropriate for where mm. their soul's at. Mm. And this again breeds compassion and the absence of at least judgment and superiority mm. or inferiority. Mm. So everybody's on their own timeline. And even though it might seem like it doesn't make sense that the people that have been, you know, for example, laid off because they mm. wouldn't subscribe to whatever the current narrative that the politicians yeah. were pushing and celebrities and late mm. you know, night sh- comedians and all the bullshit... Mm that's you know they felt the need to acquiesce that's where their souls are and there's something to be garnered from that experience Mm. versus those who might see through a narrative or a a propaganda campaign they are like no 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 don't do that but we can have compassion for everybody's making the choices albeit Mm. usually conditioned based on what they need to experience Mm. and we can all we can do is appeal to and hopefully inspire some sort of discernment if our conversation resonates. And again, this is why I say I'm just sharing something. Right. If it works, if it feels good, try it out. If it right. doesn't, that's fine. I'm not yeah. going to be offended. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so you defined corruption fundamentally as a lie. As of today. As of today. <laughs> Literally, as of today. I was born of this conversation. Yeah, I'm we... not sure it's a definition. I'm still in the investigation of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the, uh, the synonymous nature, I would say. Yeah, there's a form of pretense. It's a... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a lie. There's, there's definitely, um, what, a connotation there, right? Like corruption yeah. almost involves a lie and lying is some form of corruption. So there's definitely something close. Um, and I, I wanted to share, I don't even know if this will be helpful or not, but no, I to share to because we th- obviously a big theme on this show is the corruption of money and how it yeah. to the corruption of many other things. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot about that term, um, I guess. First of all, it comes from, I might not be exactly right on this, but when I looked at the etymology of it a long time ago, it was close to the word rupture. Okay. So it has to do with like, you know, mm-hmm. an, an organ failing to do what it's supposed to do, kind of like 
the structural integrity of the building failing and the example you gave much earlier today. Yeah. And I think if, again, not to interrupt, but I'm playing with this and someone can probably write in and correct us. But if you think of corrosion too, right? Mm-hmm. The core, yeah. the core eruption, I don't know, but there's something that I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cor- like the yeah. corrosion of something. Yeah. The corrosion, maybe corrosion being something more inorganic. Whereas rupture is something more... But just organic. the energy of something falling apart, yeah. right? Like a lie can't be sustained. Like even right. in relationships, eventually the truth will out as an right. expression, right? right? Like you can only sustain it for so long. Yeah. Because this corruption is predicated on there being some absence of integrity. Yes, I was going to say it's disintegration or yes. disintegrating. So yes. something is corroding, it's falling apart. Yes, absolutely. Um, the other dimension of corruption that I think a lot about is... Typically, when you say, oh, you know, the, the, the city is corrupt or the legal city is corrupt, you mm-hmm. would invoke this image of maybe a judge accepting a bribe mm-hmm. so that he would either not apply the law to someone or mm-hmm. overly apply the law. Um, and so what you get to through that aperture is corruption is something like an uneven application of the rules. Which is a lie. Right. We saw one of these memes uh, during the pandemic time. Yeah. Rules for thee, not for me. Yeah. Right? So like a bifurcation in the rule yeah. structure, if you will, of the game of wh- whether it's economics, whether it's business, whatever the thing is. All animals are equal, but some are more equal. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. From Animal Farm. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. great. Yeah. I love that book. Yeah. Um, and this is where we often describe Bitcoin as incorruptible money because mm-hmm. it is this true level playing field right it's, mm-hmm. it's a set of rules that no one can change mm-hmm. you can't bend twist or break the rules of bitcoin that's kind of like the the value proposition in a nutshell right yeah. it's just a one everyone is equal in the eyes of bitcoin right which mm-hmm. is one of these old ideals of western civilization that's beautiful yeah. of equality in the eyes of the law well, yeah bitcoin is the first law that that is actually true for right yeah. that we are i guess you could say maybe the laws of physics we're all equal in the eyes of the laws of physics and bitcoin sort of leverages the laws of physics to give us this economic mm-hmm. uh economically immutable law that's somewhat with the same integrity as that so i'd I just love to share that no as a unicorn if we would extend that or continue that same premise right the again not subscribing to any particular religion but like respecting all of them but from the perspective more of spirituality or we're all sovereign beings, we could say in the eyes of the Lord, mm-hmm. you know, for yeah. your version of Lord, we're all equal sovereign beings. Lord, I've, I've, I don't know who I heard this from, but they said replace the word Lord with spiritual law when you're right. reading the Bible. And it's very, it, you get a different reading on it, but it's very yeah. similar. Yeah. So then the lie or the corruption is, uh, you know, the pretense to use the cinnamon with Bitcoin is that we live in a world where humanity is divert. Uh, dissected Mm -hmm. and there is this division that is based on the premises of worth or status and stuff like that so the underlying truth we're all we're all equal Mm -hmm. all animals are equal (laughs) but now some are more equal is that corruption yes right which is a lie so you're using the example of the local mayors taking a kickback or the golden handshake right which is now the laws that everybody understands as part of that county that Mm -hmm. community but they're not being abided by. Mm-hmm. So there's a lie. Yes. So there, There's an agreement that's not being abided by, as you said. So there's a disagreement basically taking yeah. place. And we can see this in relationships, right? Like the same thing is holds true where somebody might, you know, on a beautiful occasion, stand in front of two, three hundred people at a wedding. Uh-huh. They express their vows, which is their word. Mm-hmm. They're giving their word to something, right. which is the significance to me of vows. Yeah. And then somebody cheats, so there's infidelity. Yeah. There's corruption. Yes. We can call it dysfunction or infidelity. Yeah. But really, it's because you don't adhere to what you say. Right. Lack of integrity. Yeah. Yeah. So really, this is, again, you know, this is why I'm enjoying this, because it's, you know, the, one of the fruits of this beautiful conversation, you know, but like to investigate the nature of what it is to be corrupt, which is really to the absence of integrity which is the absence of true function or we could say high performance yeah. is where that you are not honoring what you say interesting and that is another wonderful framing for bitcoin because bitcoin can only do as code what it says it will do yeah it, it can't can li- cheat the it, system it can literally do nothing else right it's big humans can cheat yes i mean i i played out uh i played uh, growing up played uh football soccer uh-huh 
And I'm a decent athlete, but I feel confident saying if I continued at that track, I would have turned professional. Uh-huh. You know, but I know I'm like I'm good tennis player, I'm decent golfer, good skier, but I could never be professional. Uh-huh. But I was at a level where, you know, I was actually picked and scouted by a professional team uh-huh. to start the development, uh-huh. even though I was pretty young at twelve or thirteen. Um but one of the things that used to really upset me as somebody who was dedicated to the integrity of the sport, I was so passionate about it, is how many people would cheat mm-hmm. in terms of like, you know, you see it on TV now, right? The fake fall, like like mm-hmm. trying to get the penalty or the free kick. And it used to piss me off. I just wanted to play, mm-hmm. right? Stop pretending. I didn't touch you and you're like this dramatic fall right pretend pretense i just connected this yeah the pretense yeah. is to pretend yeah. the pretense yeah. is a lie yeah. right so it's a fake yeah so that's where for me i see the same thing it's corruption right albeit in this case like just playing sports and obviously the higher the stakes you know the more like you look at mlb and was it the astros i think that were you know called up for the fact that they were reading signs right they had someone who was relaying someone with a camera was relaying the signs of the catcher getting it to the dugout and quickly being able to tell the hitter what was coming. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's corruption, right? Yeah. Because it's a lie. So you're not playing within the rules of the sport. Wow. So, yeah. Man, that is so... It gets Darwinian really quick, right? Because mm-hmm. in war, right? That, that, that's sport. So you violate kind of the spirit of the sport by breaking the rules. But in war, mm-hmm. what are the, what's the old saying? All is fear and love in war, right? Yeah. You... you that's a, that's an advantage you want to establish and exploit over your enemy, right? Is to be able yeah. um, to communicate about what they're going to do next or intercept their signal about what they're going to do next. And yeah. so that's... Um, so there's a fine line right there because you also, like even in sports, right? Like I was just at Formula One, and even though I would assert there's a little bit of a monopoly there, uh-huh. they all have to function within the rules of the sport. Uh-huh. Some of them have better technology. They're going to have slightly uh-huh. faster cars. And of course, you've got the intangible, which is the human who's driving, right? Like there's going to be degree, I discern a little bit between talent and skill, right? Talent is sort of maybe you're born with, skill is something you can develop over right, time. Right. But, you know, if obviously if you've got the two, you're going to have a pretty phenomenal performer. Yeah. So th- there's so many moving parts there. But at the end of the day, I mean, look at Lance Armstrong, right? Mm-hmm. Corrupt. Yeah. What did that mean? He didn't play by the rules. That's right. It's a lie. That's He's right. pretending to be someone he's not. Have you seen, I only saw a headline about this, I don't know much about it, but Peter Thiel and some other guys are backing this Olympics that would allow doping? Yeah, I saw that. (laughs) I haven't read it. Someone told me about it. Yeah. So that would be (laughs) superhuman. How many heart attacks are we going to witness on that? Yeah, Yeah, it doesn't sound like a great idea. It sounds unethical, but it would be interesting to watch. I guess they're interested in human performance no matter the cost, right? Right, exactly. So, and again, going back to what I said earlier, like without having done any drugs, like I consider myself a purist and I could feel even in my system, right, there's a certain degree going back to the moralistic conversation of like, I don't know, maybe it's because I brought up in Britain, maybe it's because I don't have family and I've had to work for everything that I've got, but I, I there's a certain degree of despising people who will cheat. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I just don't like it, right? right? Like, and it's almost like, play fair, yeah. you know, which, you know, and as a meme again, it's like, just be kind, right? But, you know, where is that competition? And there's so much at stake these days that I, I get it. I get human nature and the fact that you want to win. Like, as you said, in war, like, lives are at stake. You're going to yes. do everything you can to survive. And this comes back to that subtle distinction between are we living from the perspective of what i call the 1.0 mindset which is based in limitation fear and suffering and disease which is predominantly a survival it is survival that's it so when you are in that mindset of survival you're going to do whatever it takes and sometimes grossly at the expense of other human beings maybe it's because i not completely but i have circumnavigated and transcended that space this is why i'm passionate about what i do that i have compassion for the people who still cheat but I appeal to the better nature of humans to just try and be kind. You know? right, right. And, and I, I often say, if you can't be loving, at least stop abuse, you know? Right, right. Because there's a continuum there, right? Like if a lot of people who've been brought up in a, a hostile environment, they were beaten, they were hurt, they were traumatized, to appeal them to be loving, it, it's almost like asking a three-year-old to bench press 300 pounds. Like, they, <laughs> you know, it's not available to them. Right. They can't access that. So. But I think people can at least understand the difference between harm and abuse and lying right. and not. Even yes. if you can't get to the more positive attributes, but this um so this ethos of fair play yeah. that you are are bringing up here, 
this presupposes that there is some set of rules in place. Right? Yeah, it does. So how do you think about uh, what's coming up for me here is like, you know, Peterson's got these rules to live by, 12 rules to live by was his book or whatever. Like yeah. how this is obviously the domain of ethics. Mm-hmm. Are there certain rules that you try to live by? I know you said you don't su- subscribe to any specific religion. However, mm-hmm. do you uh, inherit mm-hmm. certain religious precepts that you try to live by? Or how do you, how do you think about rules for living? That's great. And I can, you know, even with you right now, live and on the spot, you know, look at what could be part of my conditioning that gives rise to that. Because for somebody who's brought up in a family where you're one of six kids and you literally had to fight to make sure you got food from the dinner table, Mm. you know, for you, your conditioning is like, you just got to do whatever it takes to fucking make it. Right. So I think it goes back to what I was saying about the hierarchy of needs. A certain, you know, I'm orphaned, right? I, I am literally the only me on the planet, not only as a human, but in terms of family. I don't have anyone. And this was a new realization that, I am alone was one of my conditioned constraints, right? right? Which we could say in the negation is that that I do not have family. Mm. It's literal, but it gives an experience that made me feel like no one's got my fucking back. Mm. Like I go through something really hard. No one's showing up for me. Right. I go through a bad breakup. I don't have a brother that I can go and lie on his couch or a dad's going to fly in from across the world to you know nurse me back to emotional well-being. Yeah. And so what I realized recently is that left me in a subtle state of my own version of survival. Yeah. Not in the way that I'm causing any harm or I'm being malicious or hurtful to people, but it is nonetheless, it's where my guard is up, right? I'm, there's a little bit of this, you know, protective mm-hmm. nature. Mm-hmm. And so that's helped immensely because some of the people in my life have really stepped up, like even people in my team and my executive assistant and some people who are helping me with coaching stuff in my coaching model. Like there's some coaches that are sort of, working with me, beneath me, whatever, supporting, they've all shown up in a way that is just so beautiful that is Mm -hmm. created family, not Mm -hmm. blood. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting dynamic where people in families, there's almost a license to be abusive, you know, mistreat family because they can't go anywhere, (laughs) right? It's it's sort of weird and I've sort of learned that as well. But to come full circle to where maybe some of my conditioning came from is like I did study these Eastern philosophies, particularly of yoga and Ayurveda, And there's a term called ahimsa, which is to do no harm. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, it isn't, I I don't know, and we can investigate it even now live, to what degree that we could say as human beings, that's an implicit part of being human. Mm -hmm. Because at what stage of the evolution of our species was that really not the case? Because you're like in a cave or you're fighting local tribes. Yeah. You know, the Attila, the Huns of the world, like, you know, they're just raping and pillaging. There's no, no harm there. Right. Um, I'd like to think as we become, hopefully, a more advanced civilization, that these things, that the tenets that I subscribe to in my own life and do the best I can to practice, and by no means am I flawless in that regard, are within that realm of no harm. Yeah. And I do think there's a continuum going back to reactive creative. Reactive is going to be in the realm of abuse, animosity, cruelty, harm. Mm-hmm. No harm is at least sort of a neutral state, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then what I'm appealing to is really how about we actually choose to be kind, to be loving, to be philanthropic, to be generous. Mm -hmm. Are they they there by default? I'd like to think so in the characteristics or the qualities of the essence of who we are within our divinity. Mm -hmm. And again, all frequencies exist in this domain, meaning that we all have the capacity to kill or be killed, right? It's a, it's deep in the DNA, right. the fight or flight. I've never been in a fight in my life. I had a dog who passed many years ago, but if anyone had hurt my dog, I, I, I don't know. I could have almost be scared of what might have come out of me, mm-hmm. right? That's sure. that primal instinct. Yeah. Fortunately, I've never had to be there. Or we have no children, right? No children. Yeah. But again, if I had a kid, yeah. I can imagine what that must be like in terms of that innate desire to protect yes at all costs yeah so i would say that part of my conditioning learning through these is some philosophies which are beautiful the whole, the whole premise of ahimsa meaning to at least do no harm mm-hmm. um again perhaps i'm an idealist i'd like to think that certainly my conversations my perspective that i you know want to share is to give that sense of possibility to people to give that sense of direction that this we can attain because if we if we were to look at it and step outside of the bubble of being human, you know, people are worried about aliens and shit like this. And I, I had an Instagram video that got a lot of 
laughter because I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, what would humans do if aliens came here? Mm-hmm. We'd shoot, we'd blow up, we'd fight. Like, that is, if that isn't a representation of the state of survival and fear that we live in, that that's the automatic reaction. Mm. I'm like, how about this consideration? If aliens are fucking flying around the universe and they can just show up at will mm-hmm. in our particular paradigm of planet Earth, do you not think they might be a little smarter? So do you not think we should probably pay attention to what they could teach us? Because <laughs> we ain't doing that shit, right? Right. Right. Talk about like the absolute ignorance of what this particular society or where we're at. You know, an advanced civilization would look at us and if they had a sense of humor, they'd, they'd be like, oh my God, these guys are clowns. Yeah. They abuse themselves with yeah. whatever, fill in the, you know, the yeah. substance du jour, yeah. you know, it could be alcohol, it's drugs, yeah. it's like self-defeating narratives. They abuse each other, and there's the myriad of ways that gets showed up, yeah. from actual physical violence, sexual abuse, to corruption. Yeah. And then they abuse their own home, their planet. Yeah. We're really not that evolved. That's a bitter pill. <laughs> uh, it is. And yet, the beauty of the game is, what we're just talking to, that there's the aspiration to perhaps do better, uh-huh. to ascend the sort of you know potentialities of what it is to be human, to be kind, to be loving, to... Uh-huh to be contributory to you know to really access this mountain without a top of what it is to be human and the potentiality and the possibility that is there it's the ultimate game of self-exploration yes yeah the game of becoming human in a way yeah was it a conscious decision for you to not have children or this is just something you've uh, no, it's not like a conscious choice. When people ever ask me and very kindly usually say, dude, you'd be such a great dad, you should have kids, and I really take that to heart, and it means a lot. Um, I I always felt the the choice of having children wasn't really mine, even though we could argue, well, you know, it's man and woman, and yeah. you have some say, but I'm not, you know, despite all the misinformation talking about corruption, yes. as, uh, how many men can apparently have have babies these days there's even an emoji now with a man who's pregnant right unbelievable yeah anyway that's a whole nother topic of conversation so i wasn't gonna have a baby myself so i always wanted to defer to in this case a woman that i may or would meet and love and wanted to listen to her right because to me the woman the feminine and particularly in this case the mother is the conduit for all creation right the power resides over there i'm a co-star i'm not the leading actor Mm -hmm. in this particular choice Mm -hmm. and so that's the way i looked at it is that if as and look i'm still open to it maybe but you know at this point it's i've learned enough and i don't know if it is in this lifetime for me um that having a kid to me was really incumbent upon and more the choice of the woman that i might be with yeah and then it would become an us choice right it's not like what does peter crone want like i feel i'm pretty content i love what i get to do i love helping people i'm a work in progress in many regards and so having kids there's also the background conversation of the world that we live in is is pretty much a fucking gong show at this point so you know do you want to as a very crass example do you want to take your kid into a hostile town somewhere where there's drugs being dealt on the street like you don't really want to walk down there as though it's some sort of fun fair. You know, it's like, so uh, as a macro version of that. But you could also argue that these kids could be the transformative factor. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, uh, there's no other way to change that world other than without bringing in new levels yeah. of consciousness. So, yeah, yeah I mean, look, I, I don't know. I, I that, that was my epiphany 20 something years ago with those three words. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> You're Socratic of you. Yeah, and it's just to live in the very nature of life, which is uncertainty, while still, to my point about the three buckets earlier, I try not to be in a reactive state. I think I do a pretty good job of that. I'm a great listener, even in the face of sometimes difficult circumstances or trying conversations, and I want to stay neutral, and then I do the best I can to be consciously, proactively loving. Yeah. Um, and that certainly, I hope, is evident in my work with people and how much I care, which used to occur to me as a as a weakness, that I was so caring. Uh, I felt it left me as sort of the good guy who never got the girl. It's uniquely human, right? Like, yeah. Really care like that is... And no. that goes back to the scorpion, right? So yeah. for me, then I realized, no, actually caring is a superpower. People don't always understand it, and they may not even believe that it's uh, it's authentic. They might think that it's manipulative, but it's, yeah. but I'm very caring. I really fucking care a lot. And so 
I also jokingly, without having any family left, I say I'm a trust fund baby. <laughs> Not because I was left a penny, I wasn't, but that I trust in the universe. And so there's a degree of co-creation mm. there where I do the best I can. Right. But I'm also open if I look at my life as a form of evidence, as the track record right. of how things have you know transpired. Yeah. There's pretty good evidence for me that things tend to, albeit with a lot of speed bumps along the way, end up in a way that's very sort of copiacetic to my evolution that is harmonious, for which I'm very grateful. So you trust karmic accounting. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's one of my favorite quotes. I say, there's no greater debt collector than karma. No greater debt collector than karma. That is a fantastic quote. Thanks. I I've very much... Um, feel you on that one mm -hmm. uh, you know we've all done things maybe we're not proud of and no. whatnot but i've constantly tried to mm -hmm. cultivate my life and reorient myself in a way that gets me back on that line right yeah it, 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 that seems to be the fundamental accountability factor of reality frankly yeah um and it's I, you know i talked to john bravaki recently in new york city and he was oh, saying cool. he's great he says something about both being accountable to and accountable for yeah simultaneously and yeah. um <clears throat> that idea that uh, you know it, again back to language right it's like doing the right thing being a good person like the, yeah these aren't hard and fast rules we can write and say you should do this in every situation but it's i guess cultivating that ability to properly respond to the world as it changes um and i think you know without necessarily being written rules i think there's sort of this unwritten understanding that if you're going to be part of a community you're going to be part of a family you're going to be mm -hmm. part of a tribe then the best way to at least survive is to stay in that belonging and it's a yeah. primal urge right that is one of the things that we all want and in lay terms i say it's the kid that just wants to be loved and accepted yeah and i would argue it's the primordial wound that everybody has is that at a very young age in order to garner that love and acceptance of our care providers, whether they be guardians or real parents, we abandon ourselves at a very young age because we kind of make this unwritten agreement, which is if you take care of me mm -hmm. with food and shelter and whatever, I'll be who I, th I think you want me to be. Mm. And when you really get that, it's pretty deep, right? And that to me is sort of the beginning of this dissolution of real self and the mm. creation of an identity that is predominantly wired to survive. Are you sick of being robbed by politicians through inflation and endless money printing? If so, you need to be at Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee on July 25th through 27th. As the largest Bitcoin and fintech conference in the world, Bitcoin 2024 stands as a beacon of monetary freedom, a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Top speakers, companies, and thought leaders from across the industry will convene in Nashville to look ahead to the next year and beyond. I will be there, and Bitcoin conferences like this have become my favorite place to socialize since becoming a Bitcoiner. Ticket prices will increase soon, Get your tickets now and secure your spot at this game-changing event. So go to b.tc slash conference and use discount code BREEDLOVE to sign up for the Bitcoin 2024 conference. Again, that's b.tc slash conference, discount code BREEDLOVE. Over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, but it wasn't until I started working with the biohacker Anthony D. Clementi last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. 
Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Can we get personal a little bit? So, sure. I, I mean, we we talked about this in our first conversation <laughs> together, but yeah, I'd love to do it in person too sure. so you lost your parents when you were young yeah you mentioned that there were certain narratives you had to uh, i don't know the right verb here deconstruct rewire reprogram confront mm-hmm. i'm not sure yeah um can you just for the audience that may not know you describe what that like in the context of everything you've said today right that yeah we can reprogram ourselves yeah language down action up how, what was your journey sure. and, and, and how did you, I guess, come to this level of understanding about both yourself and what it is like to be human? For sure. No, I'm, I'm happy to share and thank you for the invitation. I tend to be someone who's not always that interested in talking about himself. I love to listen, <laughs> but I'll, I'll happily engage. Um, yeah, I could say in the way I, I sort of articulated as the genesis of my own freedom was really sort of appealing to that trust fund, which is I didn't know what I didn't know was about to happen when it happened, right? Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm like, oh, okay, wait, there's, whether you call it, you know, the absolute, the universe or God, somebody's got my back in ways that I don't fully comprehend. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like in everyday life? Um, I fell in love with somebody in uh, Sydney, Australia. I was working with a sort of VIP couple. Of, prior to this career, I was a, a trainer. So I was transforming bodies and meat suits mm-hmm. versus minds. And it was an incredible experience. I was in Sydney and I had one of those quintessential moments. I saw someone across a crowded room, you know, Mm. undeniable form of connection, soul contract, twin flame, whatever you call it. Mm. But my form of manipulation at that point, (laughs) you know, going back to the corruption is like, okay, I just felt something fucking profound. How do I get to get her number or whatever we do, Mm -hmm. right? So we had a conversation. She had, she was seeing someone at the time. And they were going on tour. He was he was a pretty big rock star. Mm-hmm. And so I offered, based on my form of survival, really the underlying intention was corrupt, right? Which is I want to spend time with this human mm-hmm. who I don't know and I've never seen before. Uh, was I said, well, I'm happy to take you guys to the airport if you want. It's <laughs> <laughs> fucking great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, so, I mean, I was doing the best I can, like anyone, this is where I have compassion. So, you know, well intended, I wasn't like trying to do anything other than spend time with her. I wasn't even trying to break them up. I was just fascinated by, so, um, that what actually transpired, and this is things I couldn't control. So three days later, a mutual friend of ours called and said, Hey, it's this particular girl's birthday. I'm taking a lunch. Do you want to come and join us just for fun? I was like, just (laughs) <laughs> at what time where i'm going to cancel everything that exists in my life so you know we had lunch and with the three of us were there we we're having fun it was great and there was a certain degree of chemistry and so the girl probably about an hour our mutual friend had a phone call uh, hopefully this story is somewhat entertaining because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of dragging it out okay good. so she has a phone call excuses herself from the lunch table this is the first time in either of our lives that we've just been together because the other thing was a party there was stacks of people there and um, th- th- I, I kid you not, the first words out of my mouth, verbatim, I didn't even say anything like, are you enjoying your salmon or, you know, do you want some more water? I literally just said, was there anything about the other night that you particularly remember? <laughs> Which, of course, I was speaking to the moment that for me was profound and yeah. I could only by extension assume without fully knowing right, that right. if I'm experiencing that, there's something going yeah. on over there. And her words verbatim, the first words out of her mouth in the presence of me and the two of us being alone for the first time was, all I wanted you to do was pick me up and take me away. Wow. Yeah. Powerful. So right there, I kind of sealed our fate. I'm like, all right, well, we're fucked. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was beautiful. I mean, again, I'm at the ripe old age of like 23 or 20, no, 24 or 5, something like that. Wow. You know, <clears throat> so young and dumb, as we could assert we always are. But um, so that then later on and this is all due respect to her and the boyfriend because you know if i look back on this, this is something i would never do now because they're in a relationship i would never even entertain that i mean okay it's nice to have the conversation confirmed but i'm like okay until such time that you are clearly separated from somebody i don't meddle like i'm mm-hmm. not a cheater it's not my style even when i was young and so 
but it sort of did set into motion like very much like a minority report you remember with tom mm, cruise and that, yeah. yeah the whole idea of like he gets he's the quote unquote perpetrator and then that sets into cause and effects talking about the world of duality and how everything is predetermined he then is investigating why is he the murderer which then leads to the scene where he is right, right? so it's a very right, cool yeah. concept yeah. So, anyway we had then set into motion that which we didn't know but we could argue was predestined so that evening we all go out we had lunch and we went back to their place we had some drinks and whatever you do and the chemistry between us was you know palpable to even yeah, like a, yeah. the, 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 the drunk homeless person who's asleep <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, so the boyfriend picked up on that pretty quickly so the next day i get a phone call from her <laughs> Which is, I can't never see you again. <laughs> you know, the law has been laid. Oh, what? Yeah, so I was devastated. So I go from this euphoria of, like, thinking, you know, completely naively, because subsequently I've experienced way more beautiful, profound love, which even yeah. of late yeah. in the last year, which has been, you know, the pinnacle for me. But um, at the time was at the quintessential experience of that form of, you know, intimacy and bond with mm -hmm. someone. So I was then, you know, euphoric to life is meaningless. I might as well kill myself. It's so melodramatic. And I went into this sort of really heavy state. And um, I actually then had lunch. This couple, very wealthy, had a chef and I was meeting her for lunch. And I walked in and I was the trainer, right? So I'm vibrant. Like, I'm like, yeah, let's go. Let's do a workout. You know, and it was always my disposition to be a pretty happy guy. And she walked in and I uh, walked into the lunch. She'd never seen me like this. I'm just devastated, right? Like you, if I was with in front of a therapist, they would have wanted to put me on any kind of, um, you know, Wellbutrin or yeah. you know, benzodiazepine, addictive right. drugs. And um, so I was having like telling the story and woe is me. That was the first moment of like a powerful distinction for me. Because for whatever reasons, I suddenly realized, I was like, holy shit, I have such a debt and capacity to love hmm. and it became impersonal it wasn't about her mm. and i also realized at that moment that my love what i thought was love of her was not love because it was about me mm. and that was my first inclination of like love is when love is pure or authentic it's we could argue it's all embracing but it's impersonal mm. so you see this in relationships right like people are in a relationship i love you i love you we get married we have kids then we get divorced. I fucking hate you. Right? It's, mm -hmm. it's over there. And if you change, I can't love. But love doesn't do that. Right? Mm -hmm. Love allows things to be the way they are. Mm -hmm. So that moment was the first form of relief, at least I got, which is like, oh, I thought I was devastated because she's going to stay with the guy. But I was like, no, if, if it's real love, then I want what is best for her. Mm. Wow. Which was such a powerful... For me, it was relief, right? Because I was from this state of devastation to now I'm like oh, wow, if I'm so loving and if I am the energy of love, and I remember saying on a podcast once, I'm in love, yeah. not with someone, but the essence of it. Yeah. And that had a very profound distinction for me. Anyway, so then I was, at that moment, my first glimpse of freedom. Is it, is it a glimmering of wisdom too, right? Do the pain. For sure. Yeah. That was where the relief came on because, yeah. again, the corruption of my own, you know, physiological animalistic you know identity attachment to that person as though yeah. i'm in love with the love is over there with that person mm -hmm. the attachment like again we we're talking about the material possessions mm -hmm. like the values over there mm -hmm. oh no someone stole my car mm -hmm. again apart from the, the the complete inconvenience of the functionality of that there's mm -hmm. no value there right so so i realized oh the, i am the expression of love she was the inspiration for it for sure the catalyst but the love was my own expression mm -hmm. so that was the first thing so then about a week, 10 days go by, and now I'm in this more state of, you know, sure, there's a, not a longing, but, you know, okay, that would have been cool, and maybe one day, and who knows. But it's no longer devastation. I got on with my life, and I was back to being the vibrant, happy, healthy, mm -hmm. go-lucky trainer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then out of the blue, my phone rings one evening, and it's this girl. Mm -hmm. And I say, what, what, what are you doing? And she's like, can you pick me up? <laughs> of course i was like well, 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 maybe where are you she's like i'm at the airport sydney airport and she had gone on tour maybe it was a couple of weeks left the guy and and again i don't feel so bad because the relationship was dysfunctional and she had gotten caught in substance, a rock star. substances yeah. and stuff wasn't yeah. great for her and and it served its purpose and i believe that all contracts that we have in relationships mm -hmm. are some sort of soul agreements and that we get what we need i think relationships are the conduit and the catalyst for our own evolution mm -hmm. it's not necessarily holding on to the relationship mm -hmm. so much as what well, can we garner from each other so anyway i picked her up and then 
you know, that's that set into motion. This whole relationship was beautiful, a year and a half, practically geographically difficult because she was in Sydney, but then she did move and I was living in Los Angeles at the time. She stayed with me and I'll cut to the end, which is really to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> this is just need a bit of background of relatability. Yeah, yeah. So we had this beautiful relationship, all the love and everything in the world. And then one day, about a year and a half in, she decided she had to go, mm. leave me. Mm. And her words were, your love is suffocating. Mm. And it was astute in a way that I wouldn't, you know, she's smart. I don't know if she would really understand the degree to which it was accurate, but I didn't understand. I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking super loving. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> like, on paper. I was mid-20s at this point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. This is a little later now. So I, I met her. Yeah, so maybe 28, 29, yeah, I was yeah. probably a bit 26 maybe when I met her, 27. So um, I I was portraying one of my survival mechanisms at the time was to be the perfect boyfriend, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of speaking earlier to being the, res- the sort of um, recovering perfectionist. One of the ways that I tried to be that was like a lot of men, like the perfectionist as a boyfriend. Like mm-hmm. so gifts for no reason, beautiful poetry, post-it notes, all the things that actually inherently who i am i I love that whole realm of romance and being kind and loving and but much of it some of it at least was a little bit um or inauthentic right because what i couldn't see is that i was being driven by fear what was the fear precisely what life set me up for which was the loss why would that make sense duh my parents died so my experience of life is was in the narrative of loss and the loss was what? My mom died at seven. My dad died when I was 17. So I quote unquote lost the most valuable things to me that anyone could. And I'm an only child, so I don't even have siblings to lean on. So she represented the next most valuable thing in the arc of my life as a human being. And so the fear was there, unbeknownst to me, which was the precursor to the manipulation or the compensation of the coping strategy of becoming the perfect boyfriend. Mm. What was I really up to that's not so pretty to look at? I was trying not to lose her. Mm. So I wasn't playing to win. I was playing not to lose, in this case, literally. Mm. So fear will break its own heart is an expression mm. not mine. But like, so my fear basically energetically created the your love is suffocating, which mm. then made sense in hindsight because it was because it wasn't real love. Even though I'd had the epiphany of lunch with the chef, the love was unattached. I became attached over time because the evolution of my soul was to go through this process. So then it's a real cut to the end, which is super powerful. You know, for about a week or two, we were in touch and I was like anyone who's in in love, but more than anything in pain, wanting her to come back and doing whatever I could, listening for any cues of hope, none of which existed. And then eventually weren't in communication for six to seven weeks. During that period, I fell apart, couldn't sleep, calling all my friends. What do I do? All of that. Until I had these four or five, probably more incessant questions. Where is she? Is she with someone? Will I see her again? Will I have love like that again? Right? These sort of right. really unanswerable questions right. that would keep me up at night. I can remember literally one night waking up and screaming, shut up. About the questions. To my own mind. Wow. Because I, I was just... Because that's the grappling, really... the, ca- the, the, the rumination yeah. that was so gripping, but at the same time so debilitating because there's no answer to the questions, right. but I was trying to figure it out. Wow. That is the nature of fear of my ego at the time. Yeah. Which was, I was so scared because that, and again, no one's going to begrudge me. And I had so much forgiveness and compassion for myself in hindsight because I was just a scared boy who'd literally lost everything. Right. And it's the same wound that's right. coming up. Nothing to do with her. She's simply the catalyst for something that was as yet unhealed within myself. Yeah. So one day I'm sitting in this rent control apartment. I got all my possessions in probably a 200 square foot room. And I'm sitting at a shitty Ikea desk or whatever it was. And I, the questions went through my mind and I suddenly got the answer to all of them in terms of where is she? Is she dating someone? Will I see her again? Will I have love like that again? And it was three words. I don't, don't know. know. I don't wow. know. And for the first time, the truth hit me, which was, what is the truth? If someone held a gun to against my head, are you going to see her again? I don't know, right? Like, right. But the ego that is wanting to be okay, that mm. is seeking, desperately wanting security that's the 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 kind of conundrum and the contradiction and really the paradox of being human is at that same moment i realize the very nature of life is uncertainty yes as much as we can say fire is hot it's an inherent quality of fire right the very nature of life is uncertainty. right i didn't know that i was going to have this conversation i didn't know that you're going to ask me this particular question 
And so at that moment, the relief that cascaded through my body and the degree of freedom was something I'd never had before. I didn't even know it was available because I'd, like anyone else, been in the survival. As a happy-go-lucky guy, and most people are like, dude, like, you, you're so upbeat for someone who doesn't have family. <laughs> you know, maybe that was part of also my survival yeah. mechanism is looking good in that arena. Sure. But um, the, for me, the most powerful part of this was 15 minutes after I had the realization, one, I don't know, the nature of life is uncertain. And most profoundly, for the first time in my life, I was okay with that. Yeah. Because most people aren't okay yeah. with uncertainty. Right. Which isn't actually uncertainty, and we can come to that because that's very powerful. People say, I'm scared of uncertainty. No, you're not. Or scared of the unknown. No, you're not. Mm-hmm. We'll come back to that. Correct. But within 15 minutes of me having that realization, I, f- I got a visceral experience of entanglement theory, meaning the, the fact that everything's interconnected. Yeah. Quantum entanglement. Why? Because... I don't know if I had a cell phone, but my my landlord rang and it was her. Holy shit. And now she's crying saying, I miss you so much. Eight weeks after? Eight weeks after. Well, no words. And and this is how crazy it is. She had somehow ended up in New Zealand. She was at the antipode. She literally couldn't be further than where I was. Wow. So she calls, says, now she's crying, I miss you. And my explanation, just my perspective, is that I was for the first time in our relationship available. So she could feel, albeit not a conscious process, because I dropped my guard, which was fear, which is where I'd been the perfect boyfriend. You stopped the suffocation. I stopped the suffocation, which was really of myself. Wow. Right? Again, one of my favorite quotes, I say, the ego is nothing but a bow constrictor for the soul. (laughs) And so my bow constrictor fell off my neck. And I was available. She actually came back for a minute and it was beautiful, but I was a completely different human being. And that relationship, not in a way that's dismissive, but it had served its purpose. She's yeah. now happily married and actually in Florida of all places. Oh, and uh, we reconnected years later. She found me on Instagram and there's such a beautiful, she speaks so, it's so, it's so moving because I look wow. back and I go, wow, not that I was a bad boyfriend because I was pretending to be a perfect boyfriend, yeah. but the pretense to me was not that attractive. <laughs> And But she's like, no, it was still one of the most beautiful times of my life. So it's nice to have that. So, But to come full circle to what I was saying about um, the fear of unknown. Mm-hmm. When people say, I fear the unknown, I'm like, no. Because if it's unknown, you can't fear it. Mm-hmm. When you realize the nature of life is uncertain, which is unknown, mm-hmm. but there's nothing there. What people fear is what their brain is automatically projecting into the unknown. Right. So they're fearing the imagination, which is usually a reflection of their history that is incomplete or they right. haven't accepted, which is now that avoidant energy. Again, where I say past hurt informs future fear. Yeah. So things that we haven't reconciled. Extrapolation. Gets, it gets superimposed into the future. So you're yeah. not scared of the unknown. You're scared of what your brain is thinking, knowing might happen. Wow. Yeah. So that's the genesis of my freedom. So yeah. thank you. I hope that wasn't boring. But oh, that is incredible. It's, uh, again, I, I really... Don't necessarily like to talk about myself, but I want to honor the question. And but, for me, it was no, no. I appreciate you honoring the question. That was really fantastic. Are you kidding me? That was amazing. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's what got you on this path, then. That's what set you on. I this literally, path. I think, within about a week, came up with a logo. I came up with the term "be alive" as a company because I realized I hadn't been yeah. to truly be alive yeah. versus be in survival, which yeah. is not a way to live, or certainly not yeah. being vital or alive. Yeah, and and that started the whole. I I had. I very soon after quit my job, the couple I was working for were going to get divorced, and I knew that would be a tug of war through personnel. It would be ugly. So I literally saw the opportunity at that point to then, like, it's kind of like near the end of the Matrix without sounding too dramatic, where I just saw the code. Yeah. I saw all the green code and what it was to be human, why people fight, why they fight themselves, all the disease, the dysfunction. Yeah. I even saw correlations between particular diseases that people manifest based on what code they have, their negations, and... Yeah, it was weird. I mean, I can't... And again, that speaks to the trust fund, baby, because this was nothing that I curated. It's not mine. It just... I'm blessed to have received that information and insight. And when I say the very Socratic of you, right, I don't know. Yeah. Socrates famously said, the only thing I know is I know nothing at all. Yeah. So you came to that point of realization that knowledge has limitations. Yeah. Right? And crystallized in those three words, I don't know. Yeah. And in that realization, there was liberation. Complete freedom. But then, and again, to invoke the Socratic yeah. allegory, right? Plato's cave, the philosopher yeah. has to come back into the cave. Yeah. So then you come back into the cave mm-hmm. with language, yeah. which is limited. Mm-hmm. And you've been now 
playing with language to try and bring people to the same revelation. If I'm under, I'm, I'm asking you, no, saying it, but I'm asking you. Very beautifully surmised. Yeah, absolutely. And so, again, let's not kid anyone. That was a pivotal, transformative, what I would call a vertical ascension of my soul, where I literally went from one frequency, which was linear, and I was doing okay. I went mm -hmm. from basically being broke, came to America with next to nothing, working in a bar, trying to make money off tips. You know, what have I had to do to being, quote, unquote, the trainer to these two VIP actors, making a good living, flying around in G5 jets. Linearly, it looked like I was doing great. Uh -huh. But that was one of those milestones that was truly pivotal in the evolution of who I was as a human being, uh -huh. right? I literally stepped, and I probably jumped, you know, albeit completely made up, many timelines in terms of I gave rise to a new future that was now possible that wasn't previously available to me. Wow. So that's the difference to me between linear progression and a vertical ascension. So mm. I went from the world that I was in to being oblivious to the world that I then became available, it became available to me. And so from that point, I did start my company. But the point that I don't want anyone to be kidded about, I'm not sitting here like I fucking know everything. I still, even recently in the last three months, have been through, right. albeit maybe subtler, but other forms of my own constraints, going into the cave yeah. that I fear, being presented with situations that I've never been in that were very discomforting, very hurtful, yeah. you know, and equally my own part in that, co-creating an experience which, albeit on the surface, was very difficult, was equally profound for different yeah. reasons that I saw the whole context of I'm alone could come back to that, right? That this really amplified that I hadn't quite, quote unquote, transcended, mitigated, or reconciled yeah. the deep feeling of being alone. Right. And that was a blind spot. You know, mm -hmm. where I had, for that reason, a different form of communication or I was a little bit more guarded. And mm -hmm. so I'm a constant work in progress, you know, like anybody. Mm -hmm. and, course, and equally within that, I like to say we're all masterpieces and works in progress. So it's just speak to the extraordinary nature of who you are today as a being with all the possibilities that lie there, but simultaneously to be responsible or at least, at least interested in yeah. who could I be on the other side of the constraints that I may be oblivious to. That's an entirely different world to explore and one that I'm passionate about sharing. It never stops, right? Never. It That's the mouth well of yeah. which at one level is phenomenal and at another level is such a pain in the fucking ass. Uh, like I'm done already. Like how <laughs> can, how many more times do I have to cry? <laughs> it's it feels so sad yeah. and scared. And but these to me I, I always say that these two predominant experiences I think the ego or the, the part of us that we are associated mm -hmm. with have which is we're either hurt or scared and usually mm. both mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that hurt can manifest in all sorts of ways just as scared can and right. it, that's the corruption where right. we aren't fully fully trusting that we're held and right. that to me obviously is still i can you know declare i'm a trust fund baby and it sounds like a cool thing to say <laughs> clearly there's parts of me that still haven't fully integrated that yeah. because i'm not fully i mean these last few months have definitely pushed me into a whole new realm of complete profound acceptance where i do feel held in a way that i did yeah. before and um for that i'm grateful but yeah sometimes it can become you know tiresome that sure, <laughs> still, sure, have, sure. still have shit to look at and i it gives me a little bit more compassion for people like fuck this i'm yeah. just gonna drink or get on some prescription yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not advice no um, no but yeah health. there is yeah the more you learn in a way the more i don't know the well, look, I guess the closer you get to that realization that I don't know, right? Yeah. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I have some arm's length intimate knowledge of what you've been going through. So yeah. I'll, I'll be respectful of that and not go into it. Thank in you. It's recency. Um, but I would like to ask you about, because you, you <clears throat> were able to consciously program yourself after going through some of this unconscious experience, right? And there was yeah. a quote. Our screen is black now, but we had the Jung quote that we brought up earlier. Yeah, so, and until the unconscious is made conscious, it will drive your life and you will consider it fate. It will direct, direct your life, life and you will call it fate. Yeah. And that, uh, the version of that for me, I think, is this relationship with anger. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've I've come a long way with. Right? Yeah. Like I, yeah. Early 20s was just kind of a real stereotypical hothead guy yeah got into yoga fortunately through a girl i was dating mm -hmm. in my early 20s which led me to meditation mm -hmm. uh, also started doing therapy and things like this and I, I don't know i made a lot of progress i got to the point where when i moved to santa monica in my early 30s people were yeah. like dude you're so zen like you're so chill <laughs> your vibe is so great and calming and i was uh, like, you know 
yeah. you know, nine years after the fact working on it, I was like, wow, I can't believe I've come this far. Yeah. However, yes. <laughs> however, <laughs> I, I am a work in progress. Yeah. Like I still struggle with it. I still yeah. deal with it. It's ambivalent in a way, yeah. because in one way it's like energizing. Like I'm like, yeah. kind of a get things done type of yeah. guy. I don't know what the, would you call that type A or whatever. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, it can be taken too far, right? I can yeah. be abrasive. I can be hard to be around. Yeah. Um, and it often comes with like tone of my voice or even the volume of my voice. And mm-hmm. um, I'm, I don't know. I'm still trying to go through that process yeah. of becoming more of a masterpiece and relate to the anger in a way that's more yeah. fruitful, I guess. So um, yeah, if I may, with the, whatever time we have left here, like yeah. maybe you could just give sure. me a little bit of guidance on I'd uh, love a to. guy that's yeah, dealing it's, with uh, that. It's always a privilege and I always feel flattered that people might seek my counsel through whatever means, whether it's listening to this podcast or a conversation face-to-face with you or people who do my program. So yeah, so first of all, thank you for your vulnerability. Um, I know it's not easy for me even to like, especially it's almost like to segue like the more we become seeming experts and i don't like that word i don't mm-hmm. call myself an expert Agreed. the more there's this assumption that we don't have any issues right and this is something that i help a lot of my athletes with yeah i can remember prior to one of my uh, mlb guys becoming the mvp of the whole national league which is a pretty big accolade right, right. there's only two guys mvps um and one of i would say the precursors to that accomplishment was that he'd call me one day and he was really frustrated to the point of anger that he'd had a few days where he'd struck out mm-hmm. and in his mind they were soft pitches balls in the dirt that he shouldn't have done mm-hmm. and so there's this assumption because the degree to which we become masters at something is the degree to the underlying occurrence for us is that we should no longer make mistakes mm. and so one of the things that i help my athletes and my high-end performers is don't forget to keep your humanity alive mm. Right. And especially in baseball, which is a sport of failure, right? Mm-hmm. So even those who are failing seven out of ten become mm-hmm. Hall of Famers, which he actually batted three twenty or something that season. But it was because he actually found peace with the fact that striking out is not only a part of the game, but he is completely capable of doing that. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was an integration. So I <clears throat> excuse me, I share that as a bit of a precursor to hopefully what will become available for you. So mm-hmm. So if we understand the dynamics of what it is to be human, and we particularly look at this emotional response that you have somewhat readily dissipated over Mm -hmm. time, which is great, anger. Anger to me, again, just through my perspective, is a survival strategy. Mm -hmm. So usually what's underneath that, and you can speak to it to whatever degree it's accurate, is is going back to those two emotions that I said, humans are predominantly hurt and scared. Right. Within the context of these subconscious prisons that I speak to, anger is usually a byproduct of, if we use a very everyday example, a dog that's been beaten enough, Uh that was once a puppy that someone adored, that was adorable, that looked cute, that was in Hallmark postcards and (laughs) commercials, whatever, but now is a dog that no one wants to go near because you're about to be bitten and certainly going to growl. That is the expression of the side down, same dynamic. Now, is that a bad dog or is that a dog that has, through conditioning, learned to protect itself? Mm. So I would assert, and you can share whatever's comfortable for you to share, that Robert's anger is really just a developed protection mechanism. Mm -hmm. And what it usually speaks to is somebody who grew up in an environment where their relationship to life was that they're not safe. Mm -hmm. Now, not safe can manifest in different ways as a context, as a view, right? One of these corrupt codes, the negation, is either somebody's disciplined quite firmly, belts, you know, mm-hmm. rulers hit, mm-hmm. slapped, or it can just be a, an environment that feels very scary. Mm. And so the kid relates to the environment as though I'm not safe. Now that can go usually a couple of ways. Somebody could develop more anxiety, mm-hmm. fear. You're a big dude, driven, and for whatever reasons, mm-hmm. your particular conditioning and your makeup is that you're actually going to fight. Mm-hmm. So you've sort of got you got the fight, fight or freeze, right? Yeah. What I've learned now recently is in the presence of anger. I tend to be more of a freeze guy, Uh Uh right? That's what I learned is Uh that I wasn't accustomed to having the energy of accusations, hostility come at me because I've never been in that situation. Right. If I'd grown up with somebody who was, you know, particularly mean or there was like this dysfunctional like mistreatment, maybe I would have learned like you to say, you know what, fuck you, I'm going to step up. Yeah, yeah. Or somebody could go into cowering in their hiding in their own wardrobe in their bedroom. Yeah. 
So there's, if you look at those three main buckets, you can either just be like a deer in the headlights, you can run, yeah. or in your case, what you've developed is fighting. Yeah, it was definitely fighting, um, growing up fast, right? So facing an uncertain situation at a young mm-hmm. age and having mm-hmm. to fight to... What was, was there a particular situation or... Um, all, I mean, economically, okay. psychologically was sort of just on my own from a young age. What's the young you know, age? How old? Eight years old. From eight years on yeah, your own. My, so, so get accurate. My so. brother's two years, my junior. So I had a lot of responsibility to take care of him. Your brother. Okay. And so we had to get, you know, to and from school and make sure everything was. And that meant that you would walk with him. You would do custody, like a couple range rides to school. We had to make sure we would get out of school. So where the We had a uh maybe not something i would dive into here but let's just get okay. absent and okay yeah but they were in the house or you were living with someone else you were with my mom okay yeah okay yeah but dad was not around at all dad was not around no from a very young age or from five yeah from five and i had okay. a stepdad that was around from eight okay. for a few years and then and passed. what was the relationship like with the stepdad was actually he... really good we're still okay. close Did so okay good. um he was he was one of those individuals that I could depend on. Actually. Yeah. So he helped a lot. And okay. He was someone that was there for us. So again, to whatever degree you're comfortable going there, what was it like as best as you can remember in presence for yourself, an eight-year-old who is charged with responsibility that should not be an eight-year-old, especially especially with the significance of a life, which is called your little brother. Mm-hmm. What is that like for an eight-year-old to have to take that on? I don't know. Survival is the only word that comes to mind but he wouldn't have thought about survival how did he feel think about it you're charged with finding rides let getting down let down is one part mm-hmm. so there's a a huge component of your anger which i would attribute to we could say bitterness but really the hurt mm-hmm. the hurt in the absence of the father figure who really represents that pinnacle of mm-hmm. safety and providing all of these logistics mm-hmm. so there's hurt but what did you feel as an eight-year-old, considering you're an eight-year-old, meaning, okay, as smart as you are, as resourceful as you are, you're not really supposed to be a parent to a six-year-old. Right. Yeah. So what might you feel as a kid who's taking care of another kid? What might you feel, not know or think? Like day-to-day, try and imagine any scenario it where maybe... You're- like frustration oftentimes. I actually... Funny enough, my anger manifests around trivial frustrations. Yeah. Like I mentioned the thing about the package at the airport. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's like these little things that don't work. And I'm like, oh, so I'm hot about it. But yes, the frustration of having to get my brother to go to school and like it was, I was having to like, yeah, get him to do the things he needed to do to be a functional child. And it wasn't my role. Yeah. You know? And so that was, it was frustration, I think. Okay. Largely. Right, right, perfect. Yeah. So you're trying to make something happen in this yeah. case, Go you know, school. chaperone and yeah. be a guardian for your son, yeah. but it, like his son, your six year old who's like a son, <laughs> but isn't doing what you want. That is frustration. Yeah. There's a degree of, I'd say, the anger that's coming from the fact that the absence of a father. So there's the bitterness and the hurt towards somebody whose job this should be. Uh-huh. So, what might be some of the language you would say as an eight year old, the fact that you have to do this? Going back to those insidious killers I was talking about, like, mm-hmm. you have to, but mm-hmm. you shouldn't, you're not supposed to, this isn't my fucking job, like, mm-hmm. others, an eight-year-old is necessarily using that language, but can you can you feel any of that? Like, what did you feel as an eight-year-old? Was there a feeling of injustice? It's not fair? This is where things get a bit murky for me. Yeah. It's hard for me to access those yeah. feelings or memories. Yeah. But, so, and I, and I <clears throat> um, having gone to therapy... Yeah, I have a really strong semantic memory, so I can read and recall and yeah. quotes and blah blah blah. But my episodic memory is okay. actually very poor. Okay, and therapists have told me it's related to this. For sure, there's a certain degree of when you're in pure survival. Like people often ask me, "How do you remember so much? And how do you like really just recall all these things? You have such a powerful way to be able to rec- recollect whatever yeah. different things." And you must have a great memory. And I say, no, memory, good memory is a byproduct of presence. Yeah. Right. So when I'm with, like I'm with you, right? So when somebody is present, the degree to which you are engaged with and interacting with everything that's going on around you is the degree to which you have a good imprint or a clear imprint. Mm. Most people aren't present through no fault of their own because they're in survival mode. And so they're just, whether it be in an interaction, they're at a cocktail party, but they're self-conscious because it's their boss's house and they don't want to misbehave or they don't want to get in trouble. That's a survival instinct, which means they're going to be mildly anxious, fight or flight. 
their ability to recall or be present with people is compromised. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for a kid who's charged with such a big responsibility that, let's face it, is not that for an eight-year-old to take on, mm -hmm. you're in survival. So your ability to recall is going to be compromised, first mm -hmm, of all. Mm -hmm. Also, we have a degree of coping in a way that doesn't allow us to really deal with or process what we're dealing with because it's not appropriate mm -hmm. to the age. And so things become blurred and numb because we're literally just doing the best we can right. without having any wherewithal right. on how to actually do it. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things I hear. One, the absence of the father is going to create this hurt. Mm -hmm. There's the hurt of the frustration, which is more in the arena of kind of injustice and, as you said, frustration. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to what we'll get to, which is the degree to which we feel like we have some say or power over a situation. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that I would consider you to just entertain is the other energy of being scared. Mm -hmm. It may not what have you felt. It would have been underneath the frustration. I was definitely scared, for sure. Scared, because sure. think about the responsibility of an eight-year-old of his for brother. Sure. What happens if? The I'm uncertainty, like you said earlier, is like all of these things you need to do, right? Get yeah. to school, have lunch, when I get home from school, get yeah. clean clothes, whatever. Like mm -hmm. that, There was a fear that I would not be able to do those things. Yes. For sure. So now if we start to merge these, and there's different contexts that I could, what I call context, these constraints, the negations. So could you at times feel the energy that would have, in language, been, I don't feel safe as, a, as an eight-year-old, or maybe my brother doesn't feel safe? Like, because that would speak to the scared component, right? Mm -hmm. So as an eight-year-old, I'm going to just assert, just for you mm -hmm. to try on, that part of your experience of life is that we, I, he is not fundamentally safe. There's the absence of this overarching blanket of security and love, and right, you're trying, you're charged with taking care of him. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's one component. Yeah. I'd say. The other one that I want you to consider is it. There's also how we relate to the future. So not safe is more of a present state. How I feel now. Mm -hmm. When you are looking forward to the future, where there's these potential worst case scenarios, God forbid something happens that your brother doesn't get fed, you don't get the clothes, you don't whatever. The way we relate to that, the negation is I'm not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So the default lens we look at as it relates to the future, as we discussed, is unknown. Mm -hmm. But we tend to look through the lens of I'm not going to be okay. That elicits fear mm -hmm. and anxiety. So people who struggle with anxiety, that tends to be one of the pro predominant negations. Mm -hmm. They have the experience growing up of there these um, unexpected events that are scary and so that creates the illusion of, oh, shit, what's going to happen next? So there's this constant anticipation of maybe something bad happening. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not going to be okay, so now you've got, I'm not safe. I don't feel fundamentally held. I'm concerned about what's going to happen in the future, which mm -hmm. is the I'm not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And then I want you also to consider the big one, which would attribute to the powerless, uh, to the frustration is you fundamentally feel somewhat powerless. Sure. So I'm not powerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that gives rise to Robert's experience of feeling the victim or the feeling of helplessness as it relates to life. You were eight. You're not supposed to know how mm -hmm. to, you don't have a car, you're not driving, you don't have a, you know, <laughs> income and all the things that might make you more, quote unquote, the experience at least of being in power and control. Mm -hmm. So you got that triumvirate there of like, you don't feel fundamentally safe. You think you're not going to be okay, which elicits fear. And there's an overarching feeling of just being powerless. Now, even as a kid in a healthy environment, if you are given a toy and it's a little bit complex, say, you know, it has ages five to eight and the kid is four and it's a jigsaw or it's a plane that he has to build, but he doesn't have the faculties or the dexterity to, to build it, mm -hmm. what could be one of his experiences? He wants to build the plane, but he he, he can't. How's that kid going to feel? Frustration. Frustration. Uh, so I want you to consider that the combination amplified by the lack of security, which mm -hmm. is you know really imperative for a kid in an environment as we grow up, is one of the main things that creates your feeling of anger is the experience, it's not a truth, that you're powerless about something. Mm. And when you get, when that part, it's not you, it's the part of you that feels powerless. It's a remembering mm -hmm. of the frustrations of the fact that you couldn't build the plane. Mm. And one of the things I get frustrated with, or a word that comes to mind is incompetence. Yes. And so when the bag gets delivered to the wrong carousel, as I told you about last time, I'm like, yeah. in my mind, I'm like, oh, this 
airport is incompetent they're not doing it i get frustrated yes so maybe that is it's yes the incompetence is like the elegant i was not competent to deal with that situation at that age exactly so really it's the remembering of something and the judgment of incompetence is really the deflection because then you're a victim if you can blame somebody else which is the end of your judgment in this case probably your dad and maybe your mum to a certain degree where you're pushing over the responsibilities of someone, which is totally appropriate for a kid who's dependent, but no longer appropriate for a grown man who has all the resources and faculties. But it's the part of you. It's not you. So this is this what I call residual self-image. It's the kid that was left behind. Remember they had years ago the education, like no kid left behind. But it's the kid that wasn't, his needs weren't attended to, Mm. that is still driving your reactions. Because it's a reaction. In reality, to mm. you know, cite your example, you show up a carousel because the screen said ba- baggage claim four and your bag is not there. Frustration, we could argue, okay, it's, you know, we can understand it, but it's inappropriate for the circumstance. Yeah, It's an ego, quote unquote, threat. So I would assert to tap into, that's where you felt powerless underneath it because you can't control the one way to mitigate the fact that you're not taking responsibility for your reaction is blame somebody else. Yeah. The incompetence of whoever's doing the screens, the airport, because then you don't have to look at you're the one who's creating that situation. Not the situation, but the the response, right. the reaction. Right. So what you're telling yourself is there are certain circumstances where I'm powerless. Hello, that's called being human. Uh-huh. But you're not okay with that. <laughs> so what is the what is the level up here? To recognize that as being human, there are many circumstances where we all feel completely powerless. Uh. And can you be big enough to make space for the part of you that at times feels powerless? See, it's not even a program to override. It's not something to fix. My dissolution is really an integration. You're human. And you've had your experiences, your conditioning. The language that uses you was the environment of a very, quote, unquote, scary and hurt boy charged with responsibility that was not his to have, who felt consistently powerless, which his anger really is a threat response, which is how you protected yourself. Blame, aggression is the way that you're kind of punching air to try and be okay and have some semblance of power. Yeah. And now as a grown man, it's nothing about that. It's to be able to recognize there are circumstances in life that we are completely powerless about. Right. Wow. But the one arena that you have power is how do you do, how do you respond to the times that you feel powerless? And the invitation is not anger and frustration and blame, which is how you learned to protect yourself. That was the coping strategy. But rather like that breath, which is a little softer yeah. there, right? Yeah. That was the integration that just happened. Uh, what, what was going through my mind is how you said the power is in realizing you can choose how to respond to the situations in which you are powerless. That Bingo. Was a, a so my mom's might have had two very, very powerful people that I worked with where this was what I said to them. You're so powerful that you buy into the belief that you're powerless and you have a reaction. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Is you think your feelings are the byproduct of circumstance. No. Your feelings are the byproduct of your interpretation. No one is a victim of circumstance. Right. Everybody's a victim of perspective, and that you can shift. The ability to respond is always your responsibility. Until well, it is when you see it. Yeah. That's where this choice is figurative and literal. You now have literal choice. Right. So now, by virtue of this conversation, you may initially baggage four, baggage three. You, you. The instinct is, oh shit. I'm fucking frustrated and it's somebody else's fault. Right. Then you can actually bring in power and go, oh, that is the part of me Uh, that is pretending it's not okay with circumstance. Uh, Because it's not a truth. You're totally fine. You got your bag. You made it home. Right, right, right. Now, the way that I can see a little bit of maybe emotion even behind the eyes is to see how much it costs you to constantly think that you have to protect yourself through frustration and anger because the occurrence, the way it seems is, you're not going to be okay with the way things are. That's exhausting. Yeah. When you really look at it. And it impacts people around you that you probably love and care about. Absolutely. Because when it shows up, yeah. what you're saying is you're blaming them, which is the antithesis of love. Right. When we are in the energy of blame, we're not willing to look at where we are through a lens of pretense. Right. Saying, I'm not okay with this. This, what is this Chinese proverb that says, he who blames others has not begun his journey? He who blames himself 
has started and he who blames no one has arrived. Something okay, like that. that's cool. I have to find that. Whereas like can... almost the blame, it, it's, you want to take responsibility, but then blaming doesn't seem very useful in a way, right? It's it comes Even himself, out. right? But yeah. that, you know, anybody who's like hurt people, hurt people, yeah. right? So whenever there's external or exogenous blame, it's really a reflection of the fact that someone's still not willing to look at the blame of themselves, which yeah. is still a lie because right. everyone's doing the best they can within the realm of their own awareness, yeah. right? So this is where we have compassion and forgiveness. Yeah. So we can say, okay, you're a grown man, smart, articulate. you getting pissed off and frustrated at an airport, a bad airport right. out there. That nothing. Fucking, for nothing. Yeah. You start to see that the, through the lens of now awareness, which is yeah. the first stage, and then now you get to practice. So the next time that instinct, because it will want to yeah. come up, you'll realize, oh, I'm under the impression through conditioning, not yeah. choice, that this is a threatening situation that is somehow inconveniencing me. It's a waste of time. Yeah. People are incompetent. All through the lens of blame, there's absolutely no compassion. There's no love there yeah. whatsoever, which is the real hurt. Yeah. The real hurt is that, and particularly appropriate for your name, like talk about breeding <laughs> the absence of love. Yeah, you're breeding anger and frustration, yeah. right? <laughs> so. When you really get, there's so much love, compassion, and forgiveness for self to realize it's really the voice and the feeling mm. of an eight-year-old boy who is so frustrated with the fact that he's in this situation where he is feeling overwhelmed mm. in a way that he truly doesn't have any power in this, and he's doing the best he can. Mm. And we can feel into that little boy with all the compassion in the world that he was really hurt by the absence of who should have been there to do mm. that, and very scared about what that might lead to. The consequences mm. were potentially dire. Mm. It is only natural that he was completely frustrated, overwhelmed, and the feeling of powerlessness that now as a grown man makes you, because now you have the resources, in this case of emotional rebuttals mm -hmm. or anger and frustration mm -hmm. to blame, that that is a continuation of that little boy being in a place of feeling powerless. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how would that feel? So moving forward to really consciously create yeah. it, if you had an eight-year-old boy, to go back to sort of reflect on you and having kids, which we didn't discuss, but if you had an eight-year-old boy who was frustrated, not necessarily... Uh, five-year-old he... daughter. Oh, you, okay. I do have a daughter, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you have a five-year-old daughter. Yes, and this helped me a lot in therapy, too, actually. Looking at myself through her eyes was one of the practices. So I guarantee you, she is at time displayed the energy of frustration, as I said, in a more benign experience yeah. where a kid can't do something. Yeah. You know, where kids just want to partake, they want to yeah. build, they want to do, but they can't. She has my frustratability, actually. It's, yeah. It's, well, through osmosis and the energetic yeah. le legacy, which yeah. is not your fault, so don't take any guilt. But now she will very quickly, the more that you adopt this place of freedom and true yeah. love, love including the part of you that gets frustrated, yeah. not trying yeah. to get rid of it, right. the more she will start to imbibe that too, which is so beautiful. So for you, though, to be able to recognize with love and acceptance, wow, I'm human. Yeah. And there is a part of me which is totally appropriate given my conditioning that at times when things don't seem to go his way or that there's a potential threat that he goes into fight or flight. I went into freeze. Someone will run. Yeah. Guys tend to withdraw. Yeah. You're a fighter. Yeah. And that is an appropriate response for somebody whose life is dependent on external. Right. So for you to come in now as the adult, the, the wise parent and go, it's okay. Yeah. It's just bags. Let's check the board. Maybe it's a right. And then I, I did want to give myself a little pat on the back of it, if you don't like, because I yeah. had that moment of frustration. I'm using this example because it's very salient because it happened last night. Yes. I've definitely had many worse situations. Yes. But in this particular one, I had that moment of frustration come up. Yeah. The what the fuck? Where's my bag? Yeah. And then I immediately just kind of made a joke about it and was like, oh, it's great. My bag's on number three, not on number yeah. four. This is great. So I, well, I, I'll give myself a little bit of credit that I yeah, did actually- course try to diffuse it with humor in my own way and yeah um yeah that's a lot better of a response that i would have had probably 15 years ago amazing yeah. and i can only hope and this is the intentionality of course of this conversation is that the next time something like that happens the time that it takes to collapse yes. it's actually preemptive right so it's one thing to have the reaction right. catch it that's yeah. great that's yeah. a more advanced state of awareness anger. but realizing there's actually nothing to even be angry about right 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 that, so, that's a different existence. I like to realize through the integration of the part of you that is by design hurt, scared, and feels powerless, mm -hmm. which everybody has as their inner child or whatever they want to call it, and go, oh, that is a part of me. It's not me. Mm -hmm. And whenever there is anything that is certainly synonymous with experiences that have the same flavor or the same taste mm -hmm. or the same mm -hmm. appearance, like, you know, for the woman 
whose dad was big and or for the boy whose dad was big is usually more appropriate whenever he's an experience because that dad disciplined him even in the presence of a bigger man there can be the somatic experience of like oh my god i don't want to do anything and get in trouble Mm -hmm. even though this could be the biggest cuddly teddy bear of a human being (laughs) right so it's just the lens you look through is informing the way that you see life yeah so now you can start to at least through your own intelligence overriding the programming and go there's literally nothing to be frustrated over apart from when I occasionally am under the impression that I'm powerless about something. Right. And that's okay. And this is There's the so many things in life that we're powerless about. Making the unconscious conscious, that is this process. Yeah. I can't help but notice you're wearing a Scooby-Doo shirt. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't take all this shit so seriously. <laughs> is this what you're doing, what you're describing, what we've been talking about? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm assuming... Everyone has some version of this struggle, not obviously anger per se, but whatever the narrative thing is. Yeah. Someone's you're going through something trying to Yeah. I don't know, deal with the story of who you are versus who you really are, something like that. Yeah. Is this the fundamental mystery of being human that we're all contending with? And mystery comes up because Scooby Doo solves <laughs> mysteries. <laughs> so like mystery, there you go. I'd never put that together. <laughs> I, for me, it was more like, you know, I, I, I had an expression for myself many years ago that occurred to me. I wanted to have the body of a 20-something-year-old in terms of my health and vitality, mm. the mind of a wise old sage, mm. but to keep the heart of a child. Mm. And so that, to me, was sort of that winning triumvirate. So mm. as much as I can wax lyrical and hopefully my words, you know, are inspiring, but, mm. like, let's not get all too caught up in the analytics yeah. and let's have some fun and be kind and, and enjoy life. So. Mm. Um, but I like the mystery component. So yes, to answer your question, that to me is what I was speaking to earlier about. There's two types of games, right? Mm-hmm. There's the game of being human and accumulating and the linear progression of a yeah. bigger office, a bigger car, a bigger house. And then the game that I'm talking about is the emancipation from our constraints to discover true freedom. I think so, that's, a, that's a beautiful place to yeah. put a button on it. Well, hopefully you got a little bit more freedom, my friend. No, and thank you. Thank you for your humanity. And because I promise you there are a million people out there who have their own version of frustration and anger, which is a yeah. protective mechanism. For sure. It's not bad. But again, when anger starts to become blame, which is what yeah. you were slipping into, yeah. fucking up or yeah. whatever, yeah. then what you're saying is I'm a victim and that is a flat out line. Mm. You're That's so a good powerful. framing. That's yeah. a good framing for me because I, yeah, the victim mentality is something I don't appreciate whatsoever. So to frame that blaming as victimhood is good for me to frame it that way. So I know I, it, it Puts me in that perspective of being able to step out of it. And go, that's not who I'm committed to. Yes. I don't want to be a victim. And as long as there is blame, as long as there is hostility and animosity that is pointed towards something, then what you're saying is that person is in charge of my state. Yes. And that is a flat out lie. That is a flat out lie. It occurs that way, and I have compassion for people who believe it, but it's it's where they're at at this time with the absence of true knowing that we are the authors of our own experience. It's figurative choice until such time like now it becomes literal choice where now the next time you get charged with any kind of frustration or anger, you can go, hang on a minute, what is my brain, not you, my brain trying to convince me as a powerless situation where I'm being threatened? Yes. And it's not a truth. That's beautiful. Um, Thank you. For the therapy session. <laughs> You're welcome. It's very useful. Actually, I felt I feel like this will be useful and valuable to people. I don't know. My instincts yeah. are telling me that it will be. I hope so. Um, I want to, I, I, you should mention though, that you do this obviously for a living. Yes. You run a mastermind and you yes. recently started a uh, freedom membership. membership. Yeah. Community. Yeah. Just, maybe tell us a little bit. Sure. So the mastermind is sort of where it's an intensive three months. I mean, it's over time. We do every two weeks we meet. Morning session is all theory. So breaking down some of these distinctions that we've spoken about. Afternoon coaching, very similar to what I just did with you, a little bit longer. And I tease it out and explain what I'm doing. So we're coming to the end of one. We just did module six, which was epic. Um, So that is um, sort of one of my bigger programs that I run. And we'll probably be running one towards the end of the year again. But such a beautiful container. The community is so supportive and loving. The breakthroughs, as much as I've done this now, this is my fifth mastermind over the last three years. It never ceases to amaze even me to see when the lights go on for somebody and that suffering gets dissipated and someone Mm -hmm. sees an entirely new world of possibility, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, And then freedom. I had all these programs, Free Your Mind, which is sort of one of my flagship programs. Mm -hmm. I have a workshop on anxiety, depression, relationships, health. And people were sort of cherry picking and a la carte buying them. And I wanted to make everything as affordable and as available. So we put it all into one place. 
uh, this membership called Freedom because mm-hmm. it's dedicated to helping you find freedom in all arenas of your life mm. and made it super available at 29 bucks a month. Mm. And people are loving it. There's a community. You can actually be part of the feed. So there's actually a group of like-minded souls. And the way I've sort of delineated it is the combination of spiritual awakening, which mm-hmm. is, uh, we just got a little glimpse mm-hmm. of, awakening to your true divine nature, combined with human optimization. Mm. And I think we have experts in both fields, right? We had the yogis and the spiritual mm-hmm. teachers are epic, but maybe they're not in great health or they can't pay rent. Mm-hmm. And then we got people in the material world who can spell spirituality, but they'll help you make a ton of money, mm-hmm. but they're fucked in on their third marriage. Mm-hmm. No judgment. <laughs> so for me, it's like, how can we combine, you know, tapping into soul while simultaneously making the best of matter? Mm. And so it's all in there. Um, and we just launched that and it's it's already epic. The number of people are just blown away by what they're getting. I think just on numbers, we've got $7,000 worth of programming in there. Mm. And I do a monthly Q&A. People mm. can pose questions. And actually, we're soon going to be including coaching with people in the community that will become my version of kind of like a show or a podcast. Gotcha. That will sit inside there, yeah. Well, that is very cool. It has been very uh, enjoyable to watch your progression. And um, I appreciate you helping me. And it's nice to see you helping other people. And Thank you. I'm glad we got to do this in person. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you for having me over. And yeah. uh, it's a, a pleasure to have these conversations. And hopefully it made a difference for some people. So thank you for who you be and the fact that you have an audience that might be interested in this conversation. Thanks, Peter.